and welcome to Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality, part 20, The Sick Man of Europe, The Twilight of the Ottoman Empire. I'm very lucky to be joined by Hitman. Hello. Hello. Good evening, everyone. And by Columba. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. Yes, it's lovely to have you both here. So in terms of summarizing what we're going to be talking about this evening, obviously on the last episode in this series, we talked about the Crimean War. And so the segue is quite nicely into talking about the Ottomans as the sick man of Europe, because that is when the idea of the Ottomans as the sick man of Europe as a failing state or fading great power uh, becomes endemic in the Western imagination. What is really meant by this idea of the sick man of Europe is that the Ottoman Empire endures throughout the 18th century, as I've tried to maintain, as a great power with most of its territory intact. But throughout the course of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we see the truncation of the Ottoman Empire and uh, you can say a series of revolts, massacres, internal decline, foreign intervention, and of course, foreign debt management, all of which indicates that the Ottoman Empire is becoming a for lack of a better word, a failed state. However, it is a sick man. It is not yet a moribund man. So there are two treatments which are tested in the Ottoman Empire. One is a constitutional phase called Tanzimat, um, running roughly from 1838 until 1878. And Tanzimat roughly means like reorganization, right? Well, the fascinating thing about that term, Columba, Tanzimat, I mean, reorganizational reconstruction. So there's a weird parallel you can actually bring between Tanzimat and Perestroika in mm. Russia at the end of the communist era, both in the sense that these were also uh, preludes towards collapse in the same sense. The difference is, however, whereas Perestroika resulted, you could say arguably, in the facilitation of the collapse of the Soviet Union, Tanzimat was stopped and there was a radical shift in Ottoman policy when this man, the Red Sultan Abdul the Butcher, Abdul Hamid II, as he was known uh, as the Red Sultan or Abdul the Butcher in Western media, um, becomes the Ottoman Sultan and Halif um, in 1876 and assumes his personal rule over the Ottoman Empire as the last real effective Ottoman Sultan. He's not the last technical Sultan, but he's the last Sultan to wield any form of independent authority from 1878 up until 1908. And it's during this time that he tries to reconceive of an identity of the Ottoman Empire, considering you can say the, its truncation and the loss of many of its European possessions and arguably the failure of Tanzimat. And just to demonstrate the loss of territories here. So this is the map where the Ottoman Empire is at its height. This is the map just before the siege of Vienna. Nevertheless, when we look 100 years later, towards 1797, 1801, around the same time as Napoleon's conquest of Egypt, the Ottoman Empire still maintains a very sizable uh, territorial sort of extent, uh, controlling virtually all of the Middle East except the interior of Arabia and Iran, Egypt, North Africa, either directly or indirectly, and of course virtually all of the Balkans with the exception of the Maniot Peninsula and Montenegro. It really is amazing that it managed to sort of maintain such an extent even into that period. I, I find that very incredible. Yeah, and what is all... Hearing. And what is all the more remarkable is that, remember, the Ottoman Empire was founded by Osman Bey in 1299. The Ottoman Empire began its sort of expansive phase in the 14th century and its imperial phase in the 15th century. So this is a very long lived empire with a sizable sort of a territorial unit. And a very, um, a very long lived house as well, right? Yes, the same house enduring for <clears throat> 725 years. Nevertheless, halfway through today's time span, you can see that the Ottoman Empire is beginning to lose a lot of territory here. So in Europe, this is following the um, the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878. The Ottoman Empire has lost some minor possessions in eastern Anatolia. It has lost Bulgaria. Uh, it has lost parts of Serbia. Bosnia. Greece, is ten... Greece has expanded, has it not? <coughs> well, yes, this is in... I've actually had to edit this map because the maps I found were actually incorrect. Um, in, in this case, uh, this is Greece being warded uh, Thessaly in 1881, shortly following the Russo-Turkish War, whilst Bosnia and Herzegovina is striped as to indicate that is actually occupied by Austrian troops at this time. Yeah. Um, as you can see, just and the, uh, at... the the Brits, we got Cyprus, right? 
Yes, Cyprus was given to Britain during the Congress of Berlin. Crafty uh, does really. Yes, uh, but just uh, to go back from this area at uh, this previous map also, uh, look at the sizable shift in North Africa. So Tunisia and Algeria have been conquered by France. And Egypt is interesting because Egypt, uh, as we said, becomes a, a major factor in the early um, in 19th century history of the Ottoman Empire um, as a powerful wali or governor within the Ottoman Empire and even a possible uh, supplanter of the Ottoman dynasty in the form of uh, Mehmed Ali. Uh, this fails and Egypt is instead reduced to this territory around modern day Egypt and what is also modern day North Sudan and South Sudan. Nevertheless, um, they get more authority, more independence until in 1867, they are given the title of Khedive, which effectively means viceroy. But what this really means is that the rulers of Egypt are independent in all but name. Nevertheless, the Khedive of Egypt tries to steer an independent policy against the Ottomans and against the British, which doesn't end well. And in 1882, in this year, Egypt is occupied by Britain and by extension, so is Sudan. So we're seeing effectively any sort of real power that the Ottoman Empire has to exert over Egypt is virtually lost at this point. Um, the only thing which is maintained really is the title of Khedive, Viceroy, nominally in the Ottomans. But again, if, if to demonstrate how you know worthless that title is now, when we get to World War I and Britain and the Ottoman Empire found themselves at war, it was simply a matter of changing the title of Khedive to king, so as to indicate there was no longer any connection with the Ottomans any longer. So Egypt, in the middle of this time frame, is effectively independent. And at the end, as you can see, the suzerainty over Bulgaria is lost. Um, Bosnia-Herzegovina is annexed into the Austrian Empire. Um, North Africa is lost to the Italians, so is the Dodecanese. And this is just before the Balkan Wars, where this stretch of European territory you see here, linking into Kosovo, Albania, Northern Greece, and Thrace, uh, will, with the exception of Eastern Thrace, all be taken over by the rising Balkan powers. And so the Ottomans is left with this truncated Middle Eastern Empire, which will be dismembered further in the First World War. So as you can see rather incredibly from maintaining this territorial consistency throughout the 18th century. The truncation of the Ottoman Empire across the 19th century is really rather severe, and it is the prelude to a total collapse during the First World War, which will result in the rise of the Turkish national state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, many national states, really, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this territory... Um, is also belying the fact that even within this reduced empire, the Ottomans are no longer effectively sovereign. Uh, that is demonstrated during the Greek War of Independence when the Ottomans had effectively won the war with Egyptian support and were, again, perhaps on the verge of implementing their barbarization plan to remove the Maniots and the rest of the population of the Peloponnese. And then we have the great power intervention of the Russians, the French and the British, which confirmed Greece as an independent state. But moreover, this really sets the, um, the pattern of international meddling in Ottoman affairs, not just in terms of reducing territory in the case of Greece, um, and also facilitating foreign interventions in the case of the Ottomans in the Crimean War, or the French during the um, occupation of Syria in the 1860s. But we also see a considerable economic penetration into the Ottoman Empire. Well, I mean, they, have to, they, they declare bankruptcy around this time, don't they? Yeah, just to just give a brief overview of that, Columba. What's fascinating about the Ottoman Empire is that they inherit a system from the Byzantines who they conquer, which is a system known as the Capitulations, where basically they effectively outsource um, many aspects of you know the management of their economy uh, to tax tax farming etc uh, to to and also foreign powers in the form of the venetians etc and they in this way the ottomans inherit a greek administration which is interacting with the italian world i mean we saw it at the worst example of this just before the uh, fourth crusade the ottomans had, had sorry the byzantines had even outsourced their navy to the Venetians, of course, we <laughs> no, all know how. Not a good policy. <laughs> Disastrous. <laughs> we also know how well that went. But um, so the point is the Ottoman Empire is not mercantilist. It is still pursuing this free trade policy of the capitulations where it gives these trade concessions to these individual powers and these treaties known as the capitulations. But that wasn't 
even enough for the British because they weren't prepared to renew their capitulation in 1838, which lends to the Treaty of Balta Liman, which is really, you can say, the closest thing we have in terms of like the Opium War, in terms of forcing. Yeah, they want to for totally open up the economy, right? Yes, a, a forcing uh, British trade into, into China. We're seeing the economic penetration of Britain um, into the Ottoman Empire. And this also is one of the course we talked about, one of the causes for the Crimean War, because Russia and Britain are both vying for the Ottoman Empire as an effective vassal, and the British win that contest during the Crimean War. And you mentioned uh, public debt, Columba. Well, in the 1870s, the Ottoman Empire goes bankrupt. And in 1881, we have the creation of the Ottoman Public Debt Administration, which effectively becomes the de facto treasury department of the And Ottoman it's run Empire. by a bunch of Europeans, right? Yes, every, everyone from uh, from Austrians to French to English. Yes, exactly. Um, it's basically foreign coordination and management, uh, government by but government by the creditors. <laughs> it really is Paris strike. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I can just add in something, um, though we've mentioned this sort of loss of territory, what is interesting is that when they do lose territory, they are able to get this concession where the new states that emerge out of its borders or territory that is lost these states have to take a share of the Ottomans' debt, so that sort of helps them in that respect, but it's still kind of, you know, a bit of a backhanded help. So uh, yeah. I mean, this is a rather consistent policy, even if you look at, say, for example, the dissolution of Yugoslavia relatively recently, um, or Czechoslovakia. It seems to be common policy that whenever you have the dissolution of a nation state, the debt is shared out based on the economic comparative worth of those provinces. So this is a policy which is introduced to the Ottoman Empire. But yes, uh, to me, it seems the Ottomans, um, it's only more than fair if we're going to lose this territory, that that territory will have a portion of the debt also assigned to them. Uh, because if the Ottomans had were solely responsible for the debt, then their economy would really be um, completely sort of crippled by this entire process. But nevertheless, the Ottomans, we mentioned sick man, not moribund man. Um, they aren't prepared to take this completely lying down. And so they inaugurate an era known as Tanzimat. Um, Columba, would you like to explain a little bit about Tanzimat and be beyond the definition of reconstruction? Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. So I think it begins in um, 1839. Um, in the wake of the sort of uh, the conflicts or the losses in that period um, with, uh, I think it's uh, the Hati Sharif um, of Gulhain, which uh, Hati Sharif was essentially, I think in, in Arabic, it means the, the letter or the writing of a nobleman, of a Sharif. And it's a sort of, um, um, uh, it was a traditional form of sort of um, um, an edict or, you know, a statement of policy. It wasn't, it wasn't anything sort of legally binding. Um, but, you know, it, it did have a lot of weight as the sort of, um, um, you know, the opinion of the monarch, right? And so, yes, it begins then with this sort of edict of uh, Gerhain, and Gerhain means a uh, rose garden, I think, because that was where it was signed, in the rose gardens of the palace. Um, and, it, and it essentially couches, in somewhat traditional terms, this new desire um, for reform um, to keep up with the European powers, essentially. And... Another sort of, and you know, one of the major ways that this is supposedly done, you know, um, to try and sort of counteract. I mean, we've talked about, um, um, you know, like Balkan nationalism, right, and all of these sort of different movements. I mean, we've seen the Greeks. And it's just, it's an attempt to sort of counter that as well by um, um, modernizing the state and making the state more, um, making the empire more ecumenical. So um, one major example would be. Um, probably the most important example is getting rid of the uh, the jizya or the you know the tax on non-Muslims. Um, um, you know, there's an attempt to sort of bring everyone in, essentially. Um, uh, one one really interesting facet of it, which you see going through the Tanzimat period, you'd think, of course, that you know the the different Christian um, ethnic groups uh, would be happy with this circumstance that they're. Um, being treated under equal rights, but as AM has um, been at such pains to sort of explain, and I think he's done very effectively, um, you know, the sort of millet system that had been set up, right, that had existed for so long, um, had allowed the Christians to accumulate, you know, sort of massive privileges, right, and, and they were in an incredibly strong position, relatively speaking. And so there was actually a lot of Christian hostility to this sort of ecumenical reform. Um, for exactly that reason that they thought um, this is just going to 
sort of undo all of our work and reduce us to the status of just um, um, citizens, just like anybody else. Um, and I find that a very sort of um, um, interesting turn of events. And I, but but even then, um, something that you see, uh, which I found remarkable, is even um, once this sort of Tanzimat period gets underway and these older sort of forms are increasingly done away with, the Christians still do very, very well for themselves. I mean, um, you know, one of the major parts of the system was um, sort of standardizing education and um, encouraging the establishment of schools. And um, so, it was something like um, um, 600 or 700 schools were set up and at least 500 of them were Christian or the students were majority Christian. And so, um, you know, there was a real sort of uh, Christian domination there. And that, of course, led to um, naturally a lot of uh, displeasure and angst amongst the Muslims uh, and the Turks, um, at which the Sultan or the Sultans um, did their very best to sort of mitigate by, um, you know, throwing them a bone occasionally and sort of um, reestablishing the concept of the, uh, of the Caliph as well. Um, but doing this in a, in a way that conformed with these, um, um, these modernizations. And that's sort of a running theme is that you'll see um um, you know, sort of the old and the new presented together, right? And, um, you know, new traditions sort of dressed up. But um, yeah, there's this sort of broad move towards modernization on in every facet. I mean, your know, paper money is introduced as well. Um, I, I think there was also some influence because, of course, um, you know, we've talked about the French influence in, in Egypt, right? But the, there was a lot of French influence across the empire and a lot of the, um, um, the reformers, um, the reforming Turkish noblemen were French educated. And so I do think that there was serious um, influence from the Code Napoleon. Um, you know, lots of sort of uh, restrictors were removed. I think they ended up um, um, removing the restrictors on homosexuality, even, which uh, I think they eventually went back on. Um, but, you know, there was this sort of real strain of uh, liberalism uh, coming through. Um, the tax system was changed as well, as you, as you say, um, this, uh, uh, you know, the system of tax farming was uh, changed out and uh, uh, a means tested system of uh, tax taxation was brought in, you know, where, uh, um, of course, if you're wealthier, you will pay more, etc. Um, equality in the courts of law as well. Um, you know, the idea was, um, yeah, you know, it explains itself. Um, also, you know, there were uh, very despotic rules about um, um, households and household servants uh, before the Tanzimat. You know, essentially a master could do whatever he wanted with his servants. He could um, have them killed. He could confiscate all of their property at, uh, um, you know, at whim. And this was done away with as well. And there were guaranteed protections for for servants. So um, I would say some sort of admirable policies, some real admirable attempts. But again, it's always couched in this um, 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 this, this this strange sort of semi traditional language. Um, do, do you did I miss anything? Something you want to? No, no. On? Thank you for Columbo. I just want to expand on some points. Really, I mean, there are several things to go into. One of the other sort of fascinating comparisons in terms of bringing this series all together is the fact that this very much follows in the same mode of what we're seeing in Russia, which is a series it really does. of it really seemingly does, yeah. westernizing, secularizing education reforms uh, and social reforms aiming to position the empire better vis-a-vis -vis their foreign adversaries in the West. Uh, and this is really how, as I try to present the Russian imperial reforms, these reforms are very much, you can say, involving the same sort of spirit. Because Gulhane, the original edict which kicks all of this off, is really aiming at the reconsolidation of imperial authority more than anything else. In the same way that the abolition of serfdom in Russia is a way to, if anything, expand the scope of conscription. Yeah, it wants to recentralize, recentralize the government. Because if you look at Mehmed Ali Pasha, if you look at the Serbian revolution, Revolution. If you look at the Greek War of Independence, if you look at the, what happened in the Danubian principalities, now now the state of Romania, this all indicates that the bays, the governors and the outer parts of the empire are becoming far too powerful. And so to reverse this process, you can say that Tanzimat is brought in to reconsolidate the empire. And just in terms of the education system as well, when we look at the focus on education on political science, so one of the um, uh, schools was called the uh, Mekteb il Melki uh, of 
economic and political sciences, um, the idea again is almost cameralist, focusing on the science of administration, which again is very much what the Russians were trying and arguably failed to achieve in Nicholas I's reign and Alexander II really attempts to bring um, Russian bureaucrats and Russian civil service on a level which they can compete uh, with their foreign adversaries. But there's another point um, to, to almost sort of slightly negate, but well, actually no, before I come to that point, it's also interesting that there isn't actually a constitutional monarchy brought in at this point. There is a premature sort of instance of a constitutional monarchy and a parliament brought in in 1876. Yeah, um, but it's very short-lived, right? But it's very short-lived. So this is very much happening under the authority of the Sultan, who's bringing in these liberalizing reforms, um, Abdul Mijid and um, Abdul, Ab Ab Abdul Eziz. And also, it's not just um, the nature of sort of power itself, but even the location of power. So we start off with Topkapi Palace, and, yes. Abdul and these Majid, are all these are all built by Italian architects, right? What you, well, yeah, Top Capi Palace was um, the original uh, palace of the Ottomans since the 15th century, mm -hmm. and during the middle of the 19th century, from the 1840s onwards, Abdul Majid um, creates the Dolmabachi Palace um, along the Bosphorus, um, and this you know you can say obscene. Um, uh, chandelier <laughs> in the center of the, uh, of, of the famous Baccarat yes. staircase. Subtlety, subtlety is not the Turks' strong suit. <laughs> I, I mean, actually, I find this sort of interesting sort of Italianate Ottoman Baroque style really quite interesting from the exterior is, point of view. Is, but from the interior strange. point of view, I mean, I think it's gaudy beyond belief. But nevertheless, um, it's a fascinating sort of architectural style which arrives here. But again, this is to try and demonstrate an element of Ottoman soft power while everything else is falling apart. So they're learning well in terms of evoking this idea of absolutism. So again, as with Russia, the confirmation of Russian autocracy and limiting reforms based on improving national efficiency, I really think it's essential to see reform of Tanzimat in that vein. Uh, I mean, also, if you look at the abolition of the cool system, which was the Ottoman system of um, household slavery, effectively, which you mentioned, yeah, um, yeah. Columba, this is, you can say, again, equivalent to the abolition of serfdom in Russia. The Ottomans have their own system and they are abolishing it um, slightly earlier throughout the 1830s and 40s. And again, the purpose of this is to bring the Christian minorities as well as the um, uh, Muslim and Turkish minority, uh, Turkish populations to all become um, effectively leviable. They all become part of this new mm. conscript army, which can better effectively exert Ottoman power, both in terms of defense, but in terms of projecting that idea that the Ottomans can, are can ask, a great um... power. So was um the day of Shermit, was that was that gone at the by the time of the Tanzimat or was that officially sort of removed by the Tanzimat? <coughs> well, uh, uh, this is an interesting point to bring in. Uh, formally, Devashirme had been abolished, but Devashirme had effectively already sort of filled, fizzled out at this point with the abolition yeah. of the Janissaries. When the Janissaries were wiped out during the auspicious incident, um, the Ottoman Empire's uh, uh, order 66. Um, <laughs> effect effectively, uh, the, the, we talked about the idea of Christians occupying a privileged role. Well, Devashirme was both a punishment and a privilege. A punishment, yeah, yeah. In, a punishment in the sense that many Christians were forced to become child levies. That's literally what Devashirme means. At the same time, through the Janissary Corps, they could rise to become grand viziers and the highest slaves in the court of the empire. And you know, even say, for example, the uh, the eunuchs in the palace, whether it be you know, the black eunuch or the white eunuch, could exert a huge amount of power in terms of the promulgation of edicts. Because again, when, when we look at the imperial structure of power, we don't think of it in terms of the sultan. We think of it in terms of the court, in terms of the port. Nevertheless, there are elements here where, for the first time, we actively see active sultans um, in the form of um, Abdul Majid, less so Abdul Aziz. And you can really say that in terms of a liberalizing reform directed from above by a Muslim emperor attempting to introduce secularizing reforms, which are often opposed by the clergy, Columba, you can almost put this in comparison with the White Revolution uh, and Mohammed Reza's reforms in uh, Iran just before the uh, the revolution in 1979. Um, I think there's sort of there's an interesting sort of comparison to be made there uh, regarding all of the mm. you know uh, the connections one can bring. But the point I wanted to 
to, to sort of challenge you slightly on here is when mm -hmm. we look at the nationality law and when we look at uh, the, the, the spirit in which Devashermi was formally abolished, which is the uh, Ishalat Furman. Furman in Turkish means edict. Yeah. Um, and this whole idea was about improvement and equality before the law in, and religious freedom, again, very much inspired by French revolutionary language and nationality law, which is the idea of creating a F, um, basically a, a Ottoman citizenry without ethnic consideration. Yes, Ottomanism, For, right? And this is the fundamental aspect of Ottomanism, that you're creating an identity around the dynasty rather than around the nationality. And this, again, is to augment the fact that the Ottomans had a system. They had the millets. And here they're trying to recreate them in some form or another. And again, see we the see word... the exact same thing in Russia and I suppose in Austria as well, right, to some extent. Well, you see, I mean, interesting enough, you see the word millet used more and more often in this period than it was ever used before, even though the, the actual system of millets worked, <laughs> worked far better during the 18th century mm. than it ever did in the 19th century. And this is a cause of frustration as well, because there is this idea that these reforms were promised, equality was promised, even the rights for, you know, Christians to serve as witnesses um, were promised but they never came about. They were never properly implemented. So there was this, this idea of reform, this aspiration to equality, but in reality, it didn't result in equality and Christians by and large remained second-class citizens. Um, so on the one hand, you have, we've mentioned economic reform, we've mentioned the ideas of efficiency, but still the national aspirations of the peoples who, the non sort of Muslim peoples within the empire aren't satisfied. And we already have the precedent set of a independent Serbia in the form of the Sanyak of Smederevo, which is now effectively independent, and the Peloponnese um, sort of Hellas, the truncated version of Greece that we have. Um, and what really sort of inflames this is a series of revolts in 1875. We have a revolt in Bulgaria. We have a revolt in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina directed at Ottoman authority. Um, and then we have a palace coup after this. Abdul Aziz is removed and uh, Mehmed V is basically brought in by the Ottomanists to begin a series of constitutional reforms whilst at the same time, I mean, again, it's uh, you, you can say you're implementing reforms on the other, but on the other hand, you're using bashi bazooks, you're using irregular troops to go out there and intimidate the populations out in the hinterlands. And this causes a huge international outcry, um, especially in Britain, um, with one uh, William Ewart Gladstone uh, leading the charge against the Ottomans, partly as a political ploy to get yeah. at his rival. Disraeli, I mean, the bashi bazooks, they were... They they were sort of famously ruthless, weren't they? I mean, they were just sort of um, sent in to wreak havoc. Well, they were um, irregulars. They're not proper disciplined soldiers. So, you know, they're, they can be a bit rough, so to speak. Yeah, like glorified bandits, yeah. Yes, yeah. we're seeing just the indiscriminate slaughter of um, civilian populations. And of course, what you can say, the emphasis on Tanzimat, what Tanzimat was, when we saw the Greek War of, when we see the Greek War of Independence, we have to view it almost in terms of a national transgression or the Ottomans considering it as the, the national treason of the Greeks. And therefore they respond almost as it were, as if they want to not only remove the Greeks from their privileged position, but they want to annihilate any sort of concrete basis or, or sort of a constituency for the Greeks. And you can say the worst example of this could have been even the hint of the barbarization plan. Of course, this fails, the Ottomans lose. And so their ability to re sort of inaugurate and consolidate their empire through terror has failed as well. And now they have to be aware at least of public opinion, um, international public opinion. And so Tanzimat is very much going in the spirit of international public opinion in terms of introducing these supposedly liberalizing reforms um, to appease the West, which is now, you know, has a significant economic um, interest in maintaining the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. And it seems that all the goodwill you could have brought up, all the intellectual sort of deference which has been given to the most prominent Ottomanists. All of that is taken away 
when you have the rebellions in Bulgaria and Bosnia and the Ottomans aren't able to deal with it effectively, whilst they're also dealing with a succession crisis with the uh, deposition of Abdul Aziz all at the same time. Yeah, all their sort of all the sort of good work to present themselves as modernizing goes out the window when you start sending <laughs> yeah, bandits to massacre people. It's uh, not a good look. Yeah. Well, another thing with the Ottomans as well, I notice in this sort of latter period is um, there's, it, there's often moments where everything seems to go wrong at once. Um, like the, um, you know, 1876, you know, you've got the year of the three sultans, Abdul Aziz is deposed. He then dies mysteriously. It's believed to be suicide, but there's always a possibility mm. of foul play. Um, then, you know, Murad, was it Murad V? Um, Mehmed or Murad? Mehmed V. So, I think. Me me yeah, Mehmed no, V. The fifth, so he's brought in, but from what I'm reading, read he um, had sort of many physical and sort of mental, the mental disability. So after a couple of months, they realised he probably wasn't up to task. So um, the prominent sort of reform politician, um, I'm trying to remember his name now. Um, it's blanking, it's blanking. Something Pasha, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, probably. And you know, it, it Mech, Mech, a... Mech met in him Ali Pasha. That's it. Yes. Yeah. So. He then goes to um, Abdul Hamid, who was the younger brother of um, sort of Murad, and says, well, um, how about we make you the regent? And he says, no, OK, we'll make you the sultan, but you have to give us a constitution. And um, Abdul Hamid agrees. And um, on that note, is it all right if we talk about um, Abdul Hamid sort of sword girding because it's um, quite portentous? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, just one point before we, we get on to that. I, I like this idea that all, all of these all, all of these princes, because the Ottomans are, st are maintaining this principle of agnatic seniority, it's not a system of primogeniture. It's supposedly the oldest member of the House of Osman um, becomes the ruler of the Ottoman Empire. It's still a principle which is even sort of um, maintained by the pretenders to the throne to this day. Um, so you simply have a raft of princes who up until the age of 40 are kept in their cafes, their gilded cage. And you essentially, as a as a reformer, you just have an option of deposing one of these princes and um, um, just letting one of these princes out of their golden cages and just sitting them on the throne. I just find that sort of remarkable in terms of the, uh, you can say the complete isolation and almost irrelevance in some senses of the Ottoman court where you consider the uh, the comparative isolation of the princes within the situation. Yes, yeah, certainly, because um, Abdul Hamid, from what I was reading, um, he was quite shy when he was younger and um, didn't really make friends with people, he was sort of just kept himself quite introverted. And um, going on to his sort of sword girding, because well, as people know with most monarchies you have a form of coronation, the Ottomans have something called the sword girding where there's this like, elaborate ceremony where they're given the sword of Osman. It's this great um, sort of scimitar that's presented to them. Um, so as I mentioned, his sword girding was a bit um, portentous. So um, because he's coronated, well, so, well, you know, well, I mean, he's coronated around the time or comes into power around when things were going wrong in the Balkans and we're about to have the Russo-Turkish War um, not long into his reign. But during his sword girding, because it's quite a large sword and he wasn't a particularly... Um, strong or so to say well-built man um it was quite massive in comparison to him so it was a struggle to get him to actually gird it properly um also the sheik though that was um sort of overseeing the um the ceremony had there's a tradition where they have to sort of bend over and kiss the sultan on the um, left shoulder i believe when he went to do it because he was significantly taller than abdul hamid he had to really bend over quite sharply uh, not only that um there was a i think it's called the galata bridge and it's it's a bridge over the um, that's in Istanbul, and because so many people are trying to get to the, the ceremony to watch it, it ends up sinking and nearly collapsing into the uh, the Bosporus. Um, mm -hmm. And Excellent. also, yeah, exactly what you want. And um, also, I think there was like a European sort of cable car that was established in Istanbul in the European quarter. Uh, the wire on that snaps as well. So, yeah, not a good omen with all that going wrong. But um, no. 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 Well, just um, uh, sorry, just to clarify a few points. Uh, Mehmed Eni Ali Pasha was the leading light of Abdul Aziz's reign. Nevertheless, there was this reform movement 
during the later part of Abdulaziz, led by an opposition to Tanzimat known as um, Mahmoud Nedim Pasha, to try and change the succession, succession law to bring in primogeniture. The idea that you stop this succession of convenient princes locked up in the cages that could be unleashed when it's politically expedient for them to do so, and actually have a powerful sovereign sultan who is you know, going to reign for a considerable amount of time. And it's actually the attempt to reform the succession laws, which acts as the catalyst for the deposition of Abdul Haziz by uh, Hussein Avni Pasha, who was the one who deposes and raised Murad to the throne. And again, Murad is raised explicitly because he is considered to be non-threatening, yet non-threatening to the point that he's imbecilic and no one would take him seriously as a throne. So obviously it goes to Abdul Hamid, yet everyone seems to completely underestimate him. And uh, he turns out to be the worst nightmare in this case for the uh, for the Ottomanists, given uh, what happens later. But um, yes, uh, man, do you want to say something? Uh, I'm sorry. Um... On this topic, just I would go remiss if I don't mention the famous quote by Abdul Hamid, where um, he's talking to a British friend, and you know he says, "You know what to expect of us, the children of slaves raised by eunuchs." Real self confidence there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yes, uh, this is the time really to talk about Russia. We brought it, um, we brought it into consideration briefly um, in our last conversation where Russia was able to brilliantly exploit exploit the, um, the change in international opinion. You can say the uh, indefensible moral position of the Ottoman Empire to use this as a possibility for revenge against Britain and declare war on the Ottoman Empire in 1877 and achieve, you know, a string of victories. You marching through um, Romania, they get to Constantinople, uh, liberate most of Bulgaria, which of course the rebels join, and uh, support the uh, support the Russians. And at the same time, the Russians are expanding on the um, Caucasian front. Um, at the same time, so this is a disaster, an absolute disaster for the Ottoman Empire. And you can say it is a definitive rebuke of the Tanzimat reforms. I mean, there are exceptions. There is uh, Osman Pasha's uh, defense of the, I, I believe it's the city of uh, Plevni um, in Bulgaria, uh, which he's basically created as a national hero afterwards. And there's even a, um, a march which is uh, created in his honor, uh, which is, you know, become sort of, you can say symbolic of the idea of Ottoman endurance against all of the odds later throughout the last sort of phase of Ottoman history. But regardless, the Ottomans have been defeated. Um, the army has been um, de de demonstrably sort of proven to be inferior to the Russians. You can say, if anything, it proves that Alexander II's reform program has been more effective than that of the Ottomans. So bringing this in, um, what do we sort of really discuss about this next? Well, this is where we talk about the Congress of Berlin. And the Congress of Berlin, and you can say the international sort of great power intervention, again, with the Crimean War, with the Greek War of Independence, it really does just um, confirm the fact that the Ottoman Empire is in many ways the sick man of Europe, that its fate, its territorial integrity, its unity has been determined by a coalition, by a cabal, of um, international powers. Um, if anything, though, ironically, again, as if to indicate that the Ottoman Empire is a sick man, the international intervention of foreign powers is actually a benefit <laughs> to the Ottoman Empire in this situation, because has it had it just been a matter of the Russians versus the Ottomans, then the Russians would have imposed the Treaty of San Stefano on the Ottomans, which would effectively have destroyed the Balkan possessions of the empire um, 30 years before we have the Balkan Wars. Because, I mean, this is the map we have after the Congress of Berlin here. Just imagine if Bulgaria is given independence, outright independence, and Thrace and the area around Macedonia is also given to the Bulgarians as well. And um, all of a sudden, it's completely untenable for the Ottomans to hold on to Albania and hold on to Kosovo because they aren't continuously linked and the Ottomans don't have naval supremacy at the same time. So um, it's remarkable that, again, off the back of this, the Russians are able to achieve such a decisive victory and it requires an international coalition to be brought in to save the Ottoman Empire and confirm its status as the sick man of Europe. And this is, you can say, the... Um, 
the moment where Disraeli is really able to shine because it's off the back of British, the, the, you can say just the British threat of power and brinkmanship that Disraeli is able to prevent, not only prevent the Russians from gaining access um, to the Mediterranean through their supposed puppet state of Bulgaria, but he also gains control of Cyprus at the same time. Well, the argument I, was sort of, you know, we need a naval base, right, so that we can, you know, um, control the straits and make sure the Russians don't get up to mischief. Oh, that's, and, that was the pretext, at least. <laughs> and, and the perfect irony of this, Columba, is that he is setting up a territorial structure for the British Empire to maintain dominance in the Mediterranean, and yeah. who will be the one and to Egypt, complete right. that process? Who will be the one to complete that process? It'll be Gladstone a couple of years later when he occupies Egypt, having again riled so definitively against um, uh, Disraeli's uh, foreign policy. So this is um, and, yes, and Egypt mean, was, um, I mean, absolutely vital to have at this point because I think it was, um, I think it might have been during Abdul Aziz's reign when um, the Suez Canal was was finished was it not 1864. Or was it yeah, but sure, yeah so, i think it would have been after this yeah so just you know absolutely essential i mean with the trade from india for britain especially well going back to cyprus um later on because i think it became known as something like the world's largest aircraft carrier because it was um critical for britain sort of sending um reconnaissance and sort of air missions out from there during, during the world wars especially the second mm -hmm. So I was, going to, I was going to say aircraft carrier might be a bit early in the 1880s. But... I'm not sure about the expression, but it's something to like, maybe it's like the yeah. world's largest airstrip or something. I don't know. Yes, Hitman. Um, I was I, I was thinking you may have used that term rather, you know, metaphorically, but uh, mm. nevertheless, we'll get into this. So as a result of this, you can see, I, I think it's obvious actually looking at this map. The Ottoman Empire, as a result of the losses in the 1877-1878 war, has become considerably less Christian and considerably less European. Um, this is a, an ethnic map, well, I just have here, an ethnic map of Anatolia, showing there is still a significant Greek and Armenian presence in Anatolia. As, But also, if we look at the situation in European, the European Ottoman Empire is incredibly mixed. It's very, apart from Albania, it's very difficult to actually make out a continuous sort of national territory out of this. Um, as There's you can a lot see, in the West. Yes, as you can see, um, as you can see uh, in the description, we have Pomak. Uh, what a Pomak is, is basically a Turkified um, Bulgarian, um, effectively, a, a, you know, a, a, someone of Turkish descent who has been influence was a semi-Slavic, someone who speaks Bulgarian effectively. Um, so as a result of this map, as you can see, um, there is a significant Muslim core. And of course, the Albanians have also by and large converted to Islam at the same time. So without Bulgaria, with the loss of and this is also confirmed in 1881, where the Ottomans are humiliated even further when they are forced to cede the province of Thessaly um, to Greece at the same time. So it's not just the loss of Bulgaria, the loss of territory to Serbia, the de, the de facto loss of Bosnia and Herzegovina to the Austrians, which will be confirmed in 1908. Mm -hmm. um, the Ottoman Empire is losing territory on all fronts in Europe and is left with this, you can say, core linking Albania to Constantinople, uh, which has a significant Turkish and Muslim population there. Um, so all of a sudden, say, um, we should say that in a lot of these newly liberated places, I mean, <laughs> it was not a good place to be a Turk, right? So there was a lot of movement um, back into Anatolia, right, from these um, newly de-Turkified regions um, of of ethnic Turks who wanted to sort of it, escape it, it, that it, trouble. It, it's sort of it's sort of an interesting comparison because if you look at Bulgaria. There are still a number of, Bul uh, of Turks in Bulgaria even today, and this there there are several reasons for this. One is that Bulgaria didn't actually secede from the Ottoman Empire definitively during this point. As a result of the provisions of the Congress of Berlin, Bulgaria was created as a princedom within the Ottoman Empire, and only later would it get its independence. And when it got its independence after the second. Balkan War, it gravitated towards the Central Powers and therefore became an ally of the Ottomans. So as a result of that, even though there is a bit of hostility, there isn't as much 
hostility between the Bulgarians and the Ottomans, as say, for example, there is between the Greeks and the Ottomans who were on opposing sides and fought a war during the First World War and after it. Um, so the Bulgarian case is interesting. Of course, you know, the Serbs and the Albanians, we don't really need to get into that either in terms of how um, complicated that is. So it, I think it's fair to say that after the loss of so much territory, um, and the implications of the loss of so much Christian territory in particular, not just in the Balkans, but also in the Caucasus, um, when we look at the growth of the Armenian state um, under, no, no, uh, what, Nahum, what I mean is that they are to somewhat Turkified in the sense that they were influenced by the reforms of the Ottoman Empire, kind of like the Bosniaks. Um, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm just trying to communicate the fact that they were a Muslim population population um, rather than a Christian population within the empire, just to emphasize that. Um, now we need to talk about the process of reform, reconsolidating this, moving away from um, strict adherence to Ottomanism. And this is really where I want to bring in the caliphate. And I have this brief segment here um, from Tufan uh, Buspina opposition to the Ottoman Caliphate in the early years of Abdul Hamid II, and uh, it's cited in the description if you want to read more of it. Abdul Hamid II emphasized the Islamic character of the Ottoman state by stressing his own position and authority as Caliph. The Ottoman dynasty's claim to the Caliphate was one of centuries old standing, and Abdul Hamid assumed the title automatically when he ascended to the throne as Sultan on the 31st of August, 1876. The titles of Halif and Sultan were immediately confirmed at the traditional ceremony of Biat, in which the leading administrative, military and religious officials pledged their allegiance to Abdul Hamid. Within four months, the Sultan's position as Halif received further confirmation in the third and fourth articles of the Ottoman constitution promulgated on the 23rd of December 1876 which stated that the exalted Ottoman Sultanate possesses the great Islamic Caliphate, which is held by the eldest member of the Ottoman dynasty in accordance with ancient practice. His Imperial Majesty, the Padishah, Master King, in virtue of the Caliphate, is the protector of the religion of Islam and the ruler and emperor of all Ottoman subjects, Kaiser, um, it will be the more correct rendering, obviously from Caesar, Caesar Rum. In addition, so, 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 so is the idea here sort of essentially um, they want to maintain their universal authority, but do it in a less, um, I guess, national way. They want to do, they want to, you know, um, focus on the religious strength to sort of um, um, bind the empire together. I mean, that would be the overriding goal. Well, this, yes, absolutely. We're not looking at Turkish nationalism yet. It's Turkish nationalism, even among the young Turks and the Young Turk Revolution, is still a bit of a misnomer um, because many of the you know great Ottoman thinkers at this time are still thinking of themselves in terms of an Ottoman identity, a cosmopolitan idea, a European identity, rather than to be Turkish, which is to be referred to as one of the peasant stock of Anatolia. And in order to sort of emphasize this, Abdul Hamid II actually appeals to the Kurds. He appeals to the Arabs. Um, he even sets up a school for them. It's called the uh, Asilet Bektebi, um, his school for tribes. Where he well, tries I think to... as well, I mean, don't forget, I mean, all of the uh, teaching, uh, reading and writing that's going on in all of his schools. I mean, they're all getting taught Arabic. I don't think there is a um, a Turkish alphabet at this time that's being taught in schools. No, there, there is no the Latin, the Latin alphabet of the Ottoman Empire won't be introduced until the time of um, Mustafa Kemal. Nevertheless, yeah. um, just having an Arabic alphabet doesn't mean you're wanting to become ethnically sort of closer to the Arabs. I mean, this is just a consequence of Islamic civilization, um, if nothing else. So, yes, in that sense, Abdul Hamid is trying to uh, build bridges with the empire's Muslim populations while burning them effectively with the Christian ones. In no, no, no I, I, was, I wasn't going to say anything. All right. Um, in addition to the Biat, Abdul Hamid based his claim to the caliphate upon three principles, divine will, hereditary rights, and political and military power. All three were traditionally recognized justifications. Abdul Hamid introduced no new concepts. Justification of divine will dated back to the Umayyads, who had called themselves the Caliphs of God, in contrast to their predecessors, the four rightly guided caliphate, Caliphs, or Rashidun, who had claimed to be only successors of the Prophet. Using hereditary rights as a claim, the Caliphate was also a well-established practice. 
Abdul Hamid's ancestor, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, was described by its 16th century contemporary, uh, the Sehul Islam Ebusid Effendi, as the inheritor of the Grand Caliphate, possessor of the exalted imamate. And of course, um, that has implications for, I mean, imam effectively means leader, but also that has implications if you think of Shia Islam, but I won't get into that either. Mm. Um, so it's, so it's, it's Effendi, that's the sort of an honorific <coughs> as well in Turkish, isn't it? Yes, friend. Um, so, I, I mean, Abdul Hamid's own statement of his claim to the caliphate was explicitly set forth in a letter written to the Sultan of Morocco in March of 1877, in which he announced that his assumption of the caliphate and the imamate was based on inheritance since his ancestors were the great caliphs and was in accordance with the will of God and with oaths of allegiance given by the ulema, the viziers, the military commanders and ordinary Muslims. In similar fashion, the official Salamnes, the yearbooks published by the Ottoman government, declared Abdul Hamid to be caliph and sultan by virtue of inheritance and merit. Equally well established was the justification of actual power, the view that any Muslim ruler who had power and the capacity to protect Muslims could claim the caliphate appears to have originated um, with a group of 10th century thinkers. It subsequently gained, and I think the reason as to why that will be justified is because when we look at the Umayyad, I'm, I'm going back to very early Muslim history, but when we look to the Rashiduns, when we look to the Umayyads, we see the idea of Islam as a collective entity under a single authority. But during the Abbasids, the, the Abbasid revolution fractures the Islamic world, and all of a sudden you have, first of all, a separate Islamic administration based on the Umayyads in Spain, and you have centers of power in Baghdad and then Iraq in Syria. And with the Turkification of the uh, Caliphate armed forces, you see a almost complete collapse of the essential authority of the Abbasid caliphs to the point that the, the empire is just the domain of various sort of local princelings. And into this vacuum, the Seljuks come in and conquer Anatolia and you know win the Battle of Manzikert. Um, so really, I think when we're looking to this idea that the caliph can you know, be attained by anyone who simply has the power to enforce his will. It comes from, you can say, the political failings of the Abbasids. I know I'm going off into a tangent, but just to expand upon that point. It subsequently gained the support of Muslim writers and jurists like Ibn Khaldun and Halal al-Din and al-Dawani, both 15th century thinkers who profoundly influenced Ottoman thought. They held that the main function of the caliph were to protect Islam and administer the world affairs of Muslims, and that the functions of the caliph would be assumed by the sultans of countries which were widely separated from one another. The only possible objection to this view, and by implication to the Ottoman claim to the caliphate, was a prophetic tradition, hadith, which appears to be of doubtful origin, which reserved the caliphate to members of the prophet's own tribe. Um, and I believe in um, that case, you are labeled as a, a Mirza or one of the sort of uh, sons of uh, Muhammad. Um, and it's something that the Sharifs of Mecca, the Hashemite dynasty would be able to claim, but the Ottomans would not. And the Hashemites today rule over Jordan. The Caliphs, Imams, um, are from the uh, uh, Quraysh. This view was defended by the 11th, the 11th century jurist. Al and the Quraysh were... Um... Um, Muhammad, the tribe that Muhammad came from. <coughs> yeah, and was to be invoked in Abdul Hamid's reign by those who advocated the transfer of the caliphate from the Ottomans to an Arab ruler. The Ottomans were aware of this prophetic tradition, but appear to have interpreted it in the light of a fervor hadith, which asserted that the caliphate after me, the prophet, will endure for 30 years, then will come under the rule of kings. This was interpreted to mean that the requirements of the caliph must be a karashi was valid only for the first four rightly guided caliphs who reigned between 632 and 661, and that later Muslim rulers who were sultans could by virtue fulfilling the function of caliph rightly assume its title. For the Ottomans, this, they, this view was defended by the 16th century Grand Vizier Lufti Pasha and echoed by the 19th century jurist and historian Sevdet Pasha, who served as one of Abdul Hamid's own ministers. Both cited supporting statements by numerous non-Ottoman ulema and concluded that as the Ottoman state was a Muslim state and that as the Ottoman sultans were protectors of Muslims and their religion, they had a just claim to the caliphate. In addition, by conquering Syria and Egypt from the Mamluks early in the 16th century and subsequently expanding Ottoman rule into the Hejaz, the Ottoman sultans had acquired symbolic possessions uh, which strengthened their claim in the caliphate, i.e. the idea that they are custodians to the mosques of uh, Medina and Mecca. 
Abdul Hamid II's title to the caliphate appears, therefore, to have been entirely secure, and without a doubt, it was accepted at face value by the mass of his Muslim subjects. True, there was some um, allegation of which Abdul Hamid was aware that in 1876, some of the leading supporters of the Ottoman constitutional movement had discussed the idea of separating the caliphate from the Sultan and transforming it to the former Amir of Mecca, uh, the Sharif, as I mentioned, a member of the Hashemite dynasty. But the circumstances surrounding this plan remain extremely obscure, and there was no reason to believe that its alleged authors, uh, Midhad Pasha, and the young Ottoman uh, um, Nami Kamal spoke for anyone apart from themselves, the young Ottoman, obviously the young Ottomans, advocates of Ottomanism. But again, it's why would there be a motivation to do this? Obviously, would that be to sort of try and um, um, secularize that, the that, Yeah, Empire. yeah, downplay yeah. the Islamic role of the Sultan, yeah. Yes, in, instead, you, instead, I think the, the desire was almost kind of what actually happened historically between 1922 <coughs> and 1924. Uh, in a sense, you create a Vatican city for a caliph, either in Constantinople or in Mecca with, uh, with the Sharifs. And the actual temporal authority of the sultans is de-emphasized in terms of its religious significance. I mean, that's the way things were before, right? Um, you know, in the, in the past, I mean, you had a sort of very weak um, caliph in, was it was it Egypt? Um, yes, in Cairo, the Abbasids yeah. in Cairo. Yeah, but you have to remember that that was th over 300 years ago at this point. So this mm. is uh, incredibly ingrained. But yes, you're right. The precedent had exist, uh, did, did in fact exist. Indeed, the 19th century appears, to, and that will actually inform what's going on going forward. Indeed, the 19th century appears to have witnessed growing acceptance of the Ottoman claim to the caliphate among Muslims outside the Ottoman Empire, particularly in territories like India that have fallen under European and non-Muslim rule. By the 1870s, the Ottoman Empire was only the only sizable Muslim power to preserve its independence. Oh, the of course, yeah, the, Mo the Mughals are sort of gone, right? So Yeah, well, you have the Safavids, um, who are Shia, and then they're replaced by the Asfahids and then the Zand and then the Qajari. The Mughals are deposed during the Great Indian Mutiny in 1858. Mm. And thereafter, you can say that the empire of India is actually usurped by uh, Queen Victoria when she is proclaimed Empress of India, yeah, which of course officially, was a title, yeah. which was, you know, really Mughal in origin. This fact alone enhanced the prestige of the Sultanate and the Sultan's claim to the Caliphate in the eyes of Muslims everywhere, both inside and outside the Ottoman Empire. But it was precisely here that the danger lurked. The prestige of the Ottoman Caliphate depended upon its physical strength and success and the widespread loss of confidence in the Ottoman Empire's future, which accompanied the military and diplomatic disasters at the beginning of Abdul Hamid II's reign, conjured up the possibility that rivals might seek to challenge the Ottoman Caliphate and revive the idea that a true caliph must be from the Kalash, or at least be an Arab. Abdul Hamid foresaw two possible challenges. Most obviously, he had to reckon with the possibility of an Arab or Qurashi pretender to the caliphate, but he also circulated that such a pretender might gain external support, in particular from Britain, which mm. has substantial strategic interests in the Arab Middle East and millions of Muslim subjects in India. As he explained to the journalist Ahmad Midhat Effendi, England's aim is to transfer the great caliphate from Istanbul to Jeddah in Arabia or to a place in Egypt and by keeping the caliphate under her control to manage all the Muslims as she wishes. Now, this is very significant because not only is it, it I mean, it reveals many things. It indicates Abdul Hamid's, you can say, justification in adopting this title and using it to push forward in terms of a recontextualization of a identity cemented around this prestigious and, you know, accepted title that he possessed, that of Halif, which had been de-emphasized by previous sultans. Rather, you can say Abdul Hamid was in many ways the last one to really emphasize the powers of the caliph. At the same time, it's indicating that there's a precariousness associated with it and associated with this idea and that there is an, a peril, really, that this is a assault of the Christian world on the Ottoman Empire. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, the Christian world on the Ottoman Empire. And therefore, there is a sense of growing anxiety that any Christian who exists within the Ottoman Empire could possibly be a foreign agent because you're confirming Islam yeah. as the, uh, the stable sort of source of your rule. And at the same time, we are also indicating that the Ottoman Empire and the position of the caliphate can be exploited by foreign powers. Here, um, Abdul Hamid II is focusing on the idea of 
the Ottomans being dispossessed of the title and it, say, for example, being focused on Egypt, which, as you mentioned, Columba has a precedent with the Abbasids in Cairo. And say, for example, the British could say, oh, I don't know, uh, we'll just get a Hashemite or I don't know, we'll make um, the Khedive of Egypt the uh, <laughs> the Caliph of Islam. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll force the Caliph to uh, to renounce the title in another treaty, uh, you know, which will also give us more sort of a uh, economic Yeah, I mean, it's rights. just a toy. It's just a toy for the how, Brits, how, and, and, But this is also significant because this is about um, disentangling tangling the Ottomans from the position of the caliphate, yet at the same time it indicates that the Ottoman caliphate itself is something to be coveted and indeed this is a prelude to the Germans and their subsequent interest in the Ottomans and their, what they see as the potential of the Ottoman position of the caliph as they're becoming increasingly hostile towards Great Britain and indeed the potentials of their Muslim population in India after 1904 and 1905 with you the Entente Cordiale and the subsequent Ottoman-German alliance. You can mm -hmm. also see how this, um, as you mentioned, this um, this increasing dis the increasing distrust of sort of the foreigner and the Christian that this new um, policy on behalf of Abdul Hamid, you know, entailed. Um, you can see how that would lead to the um, the Hamidian massacres, right, which was what, uh, 1895. Um, so not that long afterwards. Um, um, all, all as a result of this, right? Um, so oh, yes. Well, oh, yes. Do you want to go into that, Hitman? Um, well, yes, because um, with Abdul Hamid, he was actually quite personally pious, and he has um, thousands of copies of the Quran printed and distributed throughout the empire for free. So he sort of prints them and shares them out, essentially. And he also mm. wants all officials to address him as the shelter of the caliphate um, from his own sort of privy purse. So like his personal allowance um he funds the restoration of mosques um he strictly observes all muslim festivals um also um his palace at yield is he has a mod that is like a mosque not nearby and he you know yeah he sort of seemed to be like on a procession what was it like once a week right yeah for friday prayers he would go there and pray essentially and in also... fairness this this was a very old ottoman practice what we're simply seeing with abdul had the, the second is the uh reinvigoration of that ancient practice and um, where we mentioned earlier about the many sort of Muslims fleeing um, territories that were lost, the you've also got to remember is um, in the Caucasus, where Russia was consolidating their hold there, there were many Muslims who also fled from there to the Ottomans. You have this increasing sort of Islamification of the empire. So, mm. yeah, so for example... Um, so, so would you also have a sort of increasing pressure on resources in, say, Anatolia? You know, sort of, I mean, if yes. you have all these people flowing in. And this uh, this increases the pressure on property rights, because as we saw with the Tanzimat reforms, what had been promised was, you know, equal rights for citizens. But as we see, you can say the Islamification of the areas which still remain within the empire. Um, we see, you can say, the irregular confiscations of property. Oh, you've got less tax money as a yes, result. Yeah, and this is very prevalent in Armenia. And the worst thing is we have the creation of the Armenian uh, Revolutionary Party. And we also see Armenia, the Russian Armenia, being engorged at the expense of the Ottoman state of Armenia. And so there is this prevalent perception in the mind of Abdul the Semid II that the Russians will come back for payback and they will use Armenian separatism as a justification for annexing, say, for example, Eastern Anatolia. And so this alliance between the Kurds in particular and the Arabs isn't just to cement the idea of the caliphate and an Islamic form of rule as opposed to traditional Ottomanism. And it's the to forestall let. Russian it, attempts to sort it's of to forestall, nationalism. It's to forestall Russian attempts at nationalism and it's to harass and undermine the power of the Armenians and not just the Armenians either, uh, but also the Assyrians and the various Christian populations here. Because as you can Armenians. see, you know, as you can see on this hard place. As as you can see on this map, just literally rock and hard place, as you can see on this map, the Kurds are represented in brown, the Turks are represented in pink, and the Armenians are represented in yellow. So the Armenians <laughs> are completely surrounded on all fronts by the Kurds and the Turks. And the Hamidian massacres, which are, I mean, they are considerable. I mean, this really is the prelude to the, um, to the Armenian genocide. We're talking anyway up to around 300,000 deaths, possibly even as high as 400,000, depending on your estimate, or as low as around 80,000. But again, that's the problem with all of these uh, uh, death tolls is that the numbers vary considerably. But nevertheless, as even at the lowest possible death toll, we're talking about tens, if not possibly hundreds of thousands of deaths in the Hamidian massacres. And what intensifies this 
and gives it an air of state sanction. Again, going back to this idea that you have this conception dating back from the Greek War of Independence of a national betrayal. Um, there is an assassination attempt by an Armenian revolutionary against Abdul Hamid II, which intensifies the persecutions even more. This idea that the entire Armenian nation is guilty by association, mm. and so where, where have we that, seen that before? <laughs> and so perhaps it's a, and so perhaps it's no surprise um, when you look at the border and look at the situation in Russia, that when we have the fall of, you know, the, the, with the failure of Enver Pasha with the Battle of Sarakamish, this isn't for this stream, so I don't really want to get into it, that we are setting up the situation where the mass relocation of the Armenian population and their death in the Syrian desert is sort of really um, understandable from this point of view. Um, so that's one side. We have the Hamidian massacre, but elsewhere, uh, the Ottoman Empire is actually doing rather well because it seems like a catalogue of military disaster after military disaster. Well, during the year of 1897, the Ottomans actually win a victory um, against the Greeks uh, with the help of now German intervention, a German military mission being led by a Prussian Goltz, Field Marshal right. de Goltz. And um, the Ottomans actually win back parts of Thessaly from the Greeks. And the only thing that really saves Greece is another great power intervention, um, whereby in compensation for the loss of this territory in Thessaly, uh, Crete is effectively given over um, to the Greek state, but not really. It's created as a uh, an autonomous province within the Ottoman Empire under a high commissioner who is also the brother of the King of Greece. So, <laughs> so technically, it's part of the Ottoman Empire, but for all practical points, uh, but for practical purposes, it is part of Greece. And why would the Ottomans content, you know, to to give up um, Crete for a small part of Thessaly? Well, it's because Crete was. You know, ever since you can say the Greek revolt, um, the Cretans had never effectively submitted to Ottoman rule, even going back to the 17th century when it took, you know, a quarter of a century to take over Crete. Um, the, so if anything, this was just a effectively you can say it was the Ottoman ulcer in many ways, mm. constant guerrilla wars just wearing down and expending the it's Ottoman. Always, it's always been a tough nut to crack for some reason. Yeah. So. If, so if anything, this actually resolved the situation for the Ottomans and allowed them to consolidate on the Thessalian front and maintain this territory, which is the core of um, Ottoman Europe. And the attempt to reconsolidate this further, so we have the Hamidian massacres, we have the uh, what the Greeks refer to as the unfortunate war or the Black Year of 97. Um, now we see the attempts to reform the millet system. And uh, we've already talked about the idea of... Um, the Sultan appealing to the Muslim populations um, over the Christian populations. Well, now he's appealing to a very small minority. You can see little specks of yellow, uh, which is the Aromanian population. And here he tries to create a millet, um, a nation for the Aromanians against the Bulgarians and their possible sort of uh, uh, separatism during this time. Mm. And also they could be used conveniently again against the Greeks as well to stabilize that control and cement Ottoman rule in Macedonia. And this is where we get to the fall of um, Abdul Hamid II before the greater catastrophe of the Greek wars of independence, because it's all linked. When, we, um, when Abdul Hamid II takes power, the Ottomanist party, the young Ottomans, the liberals fall from grace. Many of them, actually many of the young Ottomans actually die, but um, a large number of them go into exile. And in exile, they form the Committee of the Ottoman Union, which in 1889 becomes the Union of Progress. And this, as akin to the Filikiateria with Greek independence, is a secret liberal society which has infiltrated the officer corps um, within the Ottoman army, and it's being effectively directed from abroad by Ahmed Reza, uh, who is operating, I believe, out of Paris. And it should be noted that the only thing that really saved Abdul Hamid for so long, given the fact that there was this secret society infiltration of the Ottoman army, uh, was the fact that there were Turkish nationalists, there were constitutionalists, there were Ottomanists, there were centralists, there were federalists, <coughs> every form of faction 
you can imagine united this group. So when we have the Hamidian massacres in 1895 and 96, which you know definitively turns international opinion against Abdul Hamid II, nevertheless the Germans push on with their um, their involvement um, in the Ottoman Empire. If anything, um, it gives the Germans again a free hand to exercise more influence in the Ottoman Empire because they're prepared to overlook the situation. Um, but within the um within the situation of the U union of progress many of the officers are turkish nationalists so they support the persecution of the armenians um so this if anything stalls any potential revolution against abdul hamid ii because he is seen as a turkish nationalist he is seen as one of us it's only in 1906 to 1908 um where we have the macedonian revolutionary organization and it's finally effectively decided that the Union of Progress has to ally with all of the factions opposed to Abdul Hamid II, the Armenians, um, the European separatists. Effectively, the only thing uniting this broad association yeah, opposition is, to <laughs> is opposition to uh, Abdul Hamid II and the idea of a conservative caliphate. And what really is the catalyst for the accidental revolution of uh, 1908, the revolution that no one really expected, uh, was the Triple Entente, when Russia and England decided to make amends and decide to divvy up Persia into respective zones of influence. And this was later recontextualized as a hard alliance, even though it was never construed as such. It was meant to mend the great game, which had pervaded Russian and British um, foreign policy since the 1830s. Um, what this effectively did was incite a feeling among the revolutionaries that there was now an interna international conspiracy against Turkey, now that Russia and Britain, the two powers which reliably could act as a counterbalance, if anything, to save Turkish, the save Turkish identity. Now that Russia and Britain look to be allied, all of a sudden the Eastern question is completely reimagined. Now the Ottoman Empire isn't an essential ally of Britain. Maybe the Russians and the British are about to carve up the Ottoman Empire. So to save what is left of the Ottoman Empire, we need to overthrow Abdul Hamid II and impose a Turkish rule and a sort of Turkish renaissance. And this is the beginning of the second constitutional era and the Young Turk mm. Revolution of 1908. And as you say, um, I mean, there's a lot of sort of division and there's sort of, um, um, aren't, aren't sort of multiple um, options trialed in sort of quick succession? Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's a disaster. I mean, 1908 through... I mean, to you have like a federal system, as you say, and then a sort of constitutional system. Uh... Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a subsequent stream. But nevertheless, just to mention that from 1908 into 1913, there's an ongoing identity crisis, which is only temporarily resolved when you have the uh, coup d'etat of the three pashas from a faction of the Young Turk movement to adopt the Turkish nationalism and the German alliance. Um, but nevertheless, in terms of the reign of um, Abdul Hamid II, um, he tries to come back in in 1909 in a conservative counter coup, and this fails. And um, you were right, Hitman, it was Murad V who preceded Abdul Hamid II, and it was Mehmed V who was, again, taken out of the cafes. Yes, um, yeah. was taken out of the cafes and put on the throne. Mm -hmm. And um, effectively, as we saw with Murad V intentionally, he was to serve as the young Turk puppet throughout the duration mm -hmm. of his reign until he died. So really, I mean, uh, that's it in terms of an overview of this period. Now we can go into tangents. Uh, Hitman, you wanted to talk about um, the relationship between the Ottomans and Germany, didn't you? Yes, well, relating to this whole um sort of young Turk issue, um, well, what's it <clears throat> sort of interesting, um, so yeah, so going back, you mentioned you've got a Galtz Pasha, so it's a German military mission, it's sent by Bismarck in 1882, so um, if we re recall, um, so the Congress of Berlin is hosted in Germany, where um, Germany sort of adopts a sort of neutral um, arbitration sort of stance, not really for or against um, either side just trying to act as like a neutral broker and um Bismarck also decides to then send his military mission to help prop them up and help train the Turkish army uh, which is a bit of an about face because there was a famous expression of Bismarck's which was um the entire Balkans is not worth the bones of a single Pomeranian grenadier but there you have it he sort of decided to change his stance on that yes in fairness though that quote was in reference to um 
uh, to the Austrian sort of war during 1866 and the potentialities of power. Uh, but I agree, I agree with you in terms of the limited utility of German Prussian expansion into this region. Absolutely. Um, I just want to get your opinion on something. Why do you think Bismarck appealed to Turkey and allowed for this mission to go ahead and believed in the potentialities of Turkey, given the fact that so much of Bismarck's foreign policy rested on his alliance with Russia? Um, well, 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 all I would say is that though Bismarck did it, um, as you know, I think he was sort of, as you've mentioned before, sort of a succession to Metternich in being this sort of great eminence in Europe, trying to keep the balance of power. So he realised, yes, he relied on Russia, but at the same time, he couldn't let the Ottoman Empire completely collapse because he had to keep that balance of power. And don't forget, Bismarck did do a reinsurance treaty with Russia to try and placate them. So again, I just saw it as an extension of his general policy. It's not really until then um, Wilhelm comes in and deposes Bismarck that you get this real sort of flowering of the relationship between Germany and Turkey. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of an unfair question, because if you read enough into Bismarck, you'll understand that uh, the reason he actually built up quite a uh, an opposition base to him in the foreign ministry, despite him also being foreign minister, as well as Prussian minister president and Reich's chancellor, uh, was because his policies, his foreign policies were mutually incompatible contradictions. On the one hand, he was supporting this idea of the constitutional integrity of the Ottoman Empire and being the honest broker in Europe. For, in terms of purely German interests, of course, this was mainly focused against Britain and their interests in the region. However, at the same time, he was hinting to Tsar Alexander III that he wouldn't do anything if the Tsar decided to occupy Constantinople. So <laughs> this is one of the reasons for Bismarck's fall, but that's another tangent. So thank you. Um, continue, Hitman. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, the, I said you've got the full flowering uh, relationship with um, Wilhelm. Um, one thing I actually want to do is um, Wilhelm actually makes um, two state visits to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, one is actually uh, right after it becomes the Kaiser, which Bismarck actually opposes, but Wilhelm ignores him. And um, so th there's that one. Then there's a later one, um, which is in the 1890s. It's 1898. He actually goes to the tomb of Saladin in Damascus, and he says the following. May the Sultan and his 300 million Muslim subjects scattered around the earth, who venerate him as their caliph, be assured that the German Kaiser will be their friend for all time. So you sort of got grand pro proclamations like that. Mm. And um, in, a, in a sort of a more, going back to the military angle, um, the Germans also issue the Ottomans a lot of military equipment. So the army has a sort of Mauser rifles and Krupp artillery. And I do believe this helps contribute to their sort of their limited military success where they defeat Greece and they to put down this um, uprising in, Bol in Macedonia. And uh, going on from another tangent from that point, um, with the whole Young Turk Revolution, one of the reasons I do think Ahmad Hamid is ultimately overthrown is because the army is increasingly alienated from him. Because what happens is due to all the budgetary problems, um, the army actually has its budget cut and there's always like um, arrears in pay. So the soldiers aren't getting their pay on time, so the scrums for that reason. They win glory by defeating Greece and then putting down this revolt. But then what happens? The great powers intervene and, you know, in Crete, it's effectively independent. And then international gendarmeries put into police the area. And the same happens with Macedonia. Like you've got Russian and um, other sort of foreign soldiers being put into Ottoman territory to police it on their behalf. So the army feels completely humiliated and insulted. Though what's also important bringing this back to Germany is that um, Wilhelm actually declines to take part in this. So the Germans are absent from these um, sort of policing that, that is put into the empire. And um, also very famously, some people may be aware of, is there's the Berlin-Baghdad railway, um, which is um, sort of proposed. So they start to sign a strategic partnership between the two in 1898. And so th this is this great infrastructure project, though it, they do have a lot of issues. Um, for example, um, when they get to like the Taurus Mountains, which are in southern Turkey in 1905. Yeah, they, they yeah actually... that will present difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. And they actually it actually grinds to a halt because they run out of money. Um, <laughs> run, but, run um... out of dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also um, another railway, which is lesser known, and this segues back into the pan-Islamism point, is that the Germans also build another railway, um, which is called the Hejaz Railway. It runs from Damascus to Medina. And um, the purpose of it um, is to make it easier for Muslims to go on pilgrimage oh, to the Hajj. And, Hajj yeah. Yes, and um, this, the reason this is more successful is the Ottomans don't have to completely um, 
fund it themselves with German support. Um, many M Muslims actually um, subscribe or donate money to the, its construction so it actually gets completed and um, they eventually do plan to try and extend it to Mecca but I don't think that's uh, achieved before the, it all collapses. And um, going back to the economic point where we mentioned the um, OPDA, the, of the Ottoman Public Debt Administration, because that's under the influence of sort of the French, the, these French administrators do what they can to kind of hamstring the sort of Ottoman German sort of collaboration by making it harder to get things like the Berlin Bagnon railway built because saying, hang on, you can't put money for this. You've got to pay us our, our debt back, essentially. It really is interesting. I mean, there are so many parallels to my mind with the situation in China. You know, it's this sort of um, um, vast power and all of the Westerners are sort of jostling within it for influence, you know, and they, some of them control one body, some of them control another, um, you know, certain uh, business interests. And of course, the prominent role of uh, missionaries as well, right? I mean, there's missionaries of every stripe um, um, operating all throughout the empire. Uh, much to the chagrin of the uh, the Sultan, and the exact same thing is happening in China. You know, and um, much to the annoyance of the Chinese uh, emperor, or or would it be Empress Empress Dowager at this point? I don't think well, so. well, well, you've got Xi Xi. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, I just wanted to to build on your point, um, Hitman, um, regarding regarding the German lines. I mean, it would be less the fact that the French were a wor worried about uh, the. The, the, their debts being paid off by the Ottomans. Um, this is more an issue of strategic, a dire strategic concern from the part of the French. Because if you look at this map, I mean, it's actually not very helpful, this map, because it doesn't show the other European powers. It shows modern European borders. But one of the incredible things about the endurance of the German-Ottoman alliance um, is the fact that they were able... the the alliance was able to survive the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina by Austria, which nominally put the Ottomans and the Austrians against each other, but in reality just put the Russians and the Austrians against each other. With the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, as you can see on this map, there is a route from Germany all the way to the city of Basra. Now, were the railway to be finished, this would give German um, strategic interests in Iraq, um, and of course, this is at the same time that we're discovering oil at the same time, you know, at, the, yeah. at this precise moment, Russia uh, seemed to have a monopoly over oil from the oil fields in Azerbaijan and Baku. But mm. oil is being discovered in Arabia, oil is being discovered in Iraq, but also from a point of view of the naval perspective, yes, not only is the Medina to Mecca railway essential in terms of, you can say, building goodwill towards the Islamic community, and you can say almost giving credence to this idea that the, the, um, the emperor, the Kaiser, is the friend to the 300 million Muslims that existed at that time. But also, strategically, if it allows for the railway to, say, for example, uh, link up to Aqaba, then to Jerusalem, then to Tyre, then to Damascus, then to Mosul or whatever, then to Baghdad, to Basra, to Jeddah, then all of a sudden you have possible installations for the German Navy to exert power in the Red Sea and in the Persian Gulf, which would seriously stymie both Russian and British interests in yeah. the region. I mean, that's um, always been one of German Germany's main struggles, right? It has been sort of finding <laughs> ports. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so if anything, um, you can see the Ottoman Empire is actually going through a brief reinvigoration with this new territory based on this alliance because Germany and the Ottoman Empire together as an economic and military partnership can actually offset set many of you could say the imperial deficits which germany and this has inherited being a latecomer to the colonial game um so it, it is interesting to think of this as a um symbiotic relationship the yeah, germans provide they're sort of, the, yeah they're, they're sort of mutually strengthening each other and, and you can see how the sort of um um, you know, with the additions of modern infrastructure, I mean, that could only help the sort of the idea of the Ottomans wanting to consolidate control. You know, you can more quickly move troops and resources around and whatnot. Um, yes, because we actually with the Berlin Baghdad Railway, when they signed the agreement, um, Abdul Hamid, because um, essentially the main purpose of the railway was to make it easier to sort of move trade goods from the Ottoman Empire back to Europe and vice versa. But Abdul Hamid specifically wants a clause put in to give the Turks the right to use the railway in wartime to move troops around and also when they do agree to build it the Germans agree to build um, telegraph lines along as well and also um, to help with the communication but also 
something else to just remember is um, Abdul Hamid also makes a concession with the railway that the Germans have the right to exploit or mine um, any resources that are along the railway too. So that would especially come into <clears throat> note with oil that's found in, in other such resources. Interesting. This, this is all to summarise the fact that we've been talking about the successive state of vassalage of the Ottoman Empire, first to the Russians, then to the British and the French, and now to the Germans. Uh, this is to explain as to why arguably the German alliance was the most successful, and you can say on the part of the Ottomans, the one where they actually eagerly entered into, and would also explain how the German alliance wasn't just the accomplishment of um, Abdul Hamid II, rather this was a enduring sort of opinion among the German Otto, uh, the German um, officer class, uh, sorry, the Ottoman officer class, because when Enver Pasha and the three Pashas take power from 1813 until 1918, they are the ones eagerly supporting not only the German alliance, but also Ottoman entry into World War One on the side of the Germans at the same time. Um, and of course, this is all due not just to the economic relationship, but this also chimes in with the idea of the possible territorial expansion of the Ottoman Empire. Either, I, I mentioned on a previous stream with um, Semigog, uh, the idea of Ottoman expansion into the Turan, the idea of pan-Turkism, the idea of unifying Russia's Turkish populations, even just the Azerbaijani populations, as we're talking about proximity and expanding the Ottoman Empire into the Caucasus, but the Germans utilizing and giving credence to this idea of Abdul Hamid II's universal caliphate is also putting pressure on the British administration, unpopular administration in Egypt for the Ottomans to again perhaps take the Suez Canal, uh, initiate a reconquest of that region. So mm -hmm. if anything, the Germans and the Ottomans are using this mm -hmm. as a way to get back against both the Russians and the British. And you can say the Entente Cordiale um, and the subsequent Triple Entente really makes this possible in terms of the natural gravitation towards the Ottomans, towards the Germans, and the confirmation of that alliance, which weathers the 1908 annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So yes, that's um, uh, I'll, I'll get your f final thoughts into this, but uh, I I'm going to read an article about this, but first, Hitman, uh, final thoughts on this, uh, this particular sort of tangent. Um, well, another thing is with 1908-1909, um, so with the Young Turk Revolution, when they well, so they take over Abdul Hamid counter coups, it backfires badly, and then he's removed from power. Um, there's actually a damaging relationship with Germany because the Young Turks are quite staunch secularists um, and are very much against pan Islam. And one of the main benefits to this alliance with Germany is Germany wants to exploit the pan Islamist angle. So, what ends up happening is the Young Turks 180 on this issue and become pan Islamist in order to maintain yeah, the German alliance. It, it's, less, it's less that they were. They were they were secularists and then they became pan-Islamist. It was more that there were divisions within the camp and one faction became dominant over the other and many became, as you say, pan-Islamists out of convenience. It's interesting really, isn't it, this idea that the Germans were more enthusiastic about exploiting the caliphate than the caliphate was. Yes. Um, <laughs> but that is essentially true, yes. But there was a faction among the young Turks who were pro-Islam. It wasn't just um, entirely secular. Um, Columba? Uh, final thoughts on the tangent. Um, I I had a question. It would just be um, what was the Austrian um view or perspective or response to this um relationship with the German Empire um with the, with the Turks? Uh, mainly positive because again, it's by extension when we look at the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this also meant that the Germans were increasing their economic and military cooperation with Austria at the same time and distancing, distancing themselves further and further from the Russians and any possibility of a renegotiation of the reinsurance treaty or the dry Kaiserbund. If anything, you can say that this is a more realistic iteration of the dry Kaiserbund, albeit in this case, mm. one of the Kaisers also happens to be a Sultan. Um, but you know, the Austrians, uh, the Austrians were obviously desiring to take Bosnia Herzegovina. But like I said, the annexation of Bosnia Herzegovina, technically an Ottoman territory, didn't destroy the alliance, and the alliance endured and was able to take off during World War One. Um, mm. One of the things I've often contended, actually, is that, you know, the Austrians were vying for control over the Balkans as the Ottoman Empire was receding. And effectively, due to Russian missteps and diplomacy, the Austrians are able to secure an independent Albania, 
rather than let it be annexed by the Serbs. Um, Bulgaria, after the Second Balkan War, was brought into the Austrian sphere. Greek neutrality was effectively confirmed. Um, Romania was technically an ally of Austria. So the only real sort of uh, enemies to Austria in this region were Montenegro and, of course, Serbia. So um, it actually appeared that were it not for, you know, uh, French support to the Serbs and, you know, the, the Russian military intervention on behalf of the Serbs, that the Austrians were actually doing alongside the Germans rather well in this region and exploiting effectively the Ottoman decline whilst ironically forming an alliance with them at the same time. So, uh, mm. yes, you can say they were they were facilitating the managed decline of the Ottomans at the same time that they were wanting to build up the alliance. And as you see Serbia, this is where Bulgaria, of course, becomes, you know, Increasingly significant to strategic plans as well, and Romania. But then this, and you would have sort of, I assume, um, <clears throat> mounting resentment, especially amongst sort of, um, you know, pan-Slavist and sort of Slavic nationalist circles towards this approach. Oh, absolutely, a absolutely, yeah. operating out of Serbia and, of course, out of Russia, whose posture towards the Austrian Empire was no longer that of tolerance, is now of dismemberment, yeah, with uh, fatal not... consequences. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, that's. I think a, a good point to leave this conversation. Um, um, well, could, I, could I just ask one more question with regard uh, regarding Austria? Because we've talked about sort of um, you know French, British, German influence, you know setting up schools, missionaries, railways um, within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, were there similar activities on behalf of the the Austrians? Um, um, you know, anything anything of note? Well, the the most significant um, aspect of the Austrians is two things. One is the fact that the Austrians effectively maintained an Ottoman province for 30 years, which was Bosnia and Herzegovina. The other is the fact that the Ottomans, uh, the Austrians had a very large role in the Ottoman public debt administration at the same time. Mm. Um, and also the fact that the, the Austrians were the ones effectively determining the borders as the Balkan Wars were, you know, coming to a close and using the Austrian Navy, say, for example, to, again, ensure the independence of Albania, etc. So the Austrians had a large presence in this region also mentioned the fact that many intellectuals were operating out of vienna as well you know supporting the young turk movement this is not just paris vienna is also a central hub for yeah, subversive activities as we know um so yeah um i'll i'll get onto this article now this article is uh we'll, we'll see how how much we get into it but this is an extension of the article i read out last week which was by andre zorin and this is really leaning into the nationalism aspect of that of national of autocracy of, what, what's the name of, of the author again uh, his name is selim uh Deringil, mm -hmm. and the yeah. article is called the invention the invention of tradition as public image in the late ottoman empire a very so good article the, by the way i would recommend yeah, so, reading if we don't get so through this it. is so this is leaning into the idea of treatments for the sick man of europe and trying to redefine the empire's identity during its twilight phase the 19th century, a time when world history seemed to accelerate, was the epoch of the Risorgimento and the unification of Germany. It was also an epoch which saw the last efforts of the dynastic Ancien regime empires, Habsburg, Romanov, Ottoman, to shore up their political systems with methods often borrowed from their adversaries, the nationalist liberals. And of course, that was a, a fundamental point of Zorin's article last week. Eric Hobsbawm's inspiring recent study has pointed out in the world after the French Revolution, it was no longer enough for monarchies to claim a divine right, additional ideological reinforcement was required. The need to provide a new or at least supplementary national foundation for this institution was felt as states as secure from revolution as George III's Britain or Nicholas I's Russia. Just um, on, that not, on that note, maybe it's informed by my own reading of Eric Hobsbawm, but I don't take this as a particularly original point, nor do I agree with the view that divine right alone was sufficient. I mean, even just based on the previous statement we read about the, the many titles and the many claims of the Ottoman Empire in particular, um, when we look to Austria, especially when we look to Russia, there are much older illusions, but even the whole notion of monarchy and nations is conceived in a Christian sense, arriving from the idea of tribal affinities and aristocracies. It's not just the fact that they are random people allotted and claiming um, divine right of kings. And um, <laughs> again, we'll, maybe you can read uh, Age of Capitalism and uh, the Age of Empires again. But um, I, I, I don't, this national foundation, really, I don't consider it to be additional ideological reinforcement, but I see it as a recontextualization in light of these ideas, which is why 
when we look at the idea of national education in response to French ideas, we are taking the ideas of Rousseau, taking the ideas of the French Revolution, and we're trying to reimagine them in light of older ideas, which is what we saw in Russia. Certainly. This meant, first and foremost, the securing of the monarchy's grip on what was coming more and more to be considered an extremely volatile and combustible entity. The people. Police measures and naked coercion were no longer sufficient by themselves, even if it, the means to enforce them were available, and often they were not. The monarchies increasingly needed what Anthony Smith has referred to as mobilization and inclusion of, the broad, of, of a broader strata. Although the Romanov, Ottoman or Habsburg houses could hardly be expected to create citizenry outright, they certainly prepared the ground for the growth of that very idea. As put by Benedict Anderson, because of the rapid rising prestige all over Europe of the national idea, there was a discernible tendency among the Euro-Mediterranean monarchies to sidle inwards a beckoning of national identification. I think this is a, a really interesting point, this idea of sort of taking the... Um... Um, how would you say the sort of cultural um, capital of the upper class or the nobility and sort of trying to filter it down and extend it to foster this sense of um, and this sort of cultivated um, um, nationalism or this Ottomanism, um, the support for the Sultan. I find that very interesting idea. And would you say, um, and this is just an idea, but um, of course that would work much better if you have a, a very large burgeoning you know bourgeoisie and increasing middle class um such as we've seen you know blow up you know to unprecedented levels in in europe right the heart of nationalism so would you say that um um you know what perhaps one of the reasons why it was less successful in the ottoman empire is because they simply didn't have that that, that same level of education that same sort of um, middle class um would that be a sort of fair point to make what do you what would you make of that well, this is certainly what Uvanov thought when conceiving of the official nationality. The idea that the, the idea of a beckoning national identification or official nationality had to be inculcated in the education of state agents. And insufficient education would be responsible for not only confusion, but loss of face, loss of morale, and obviously loss of faith in the institutions of the state and breaking down and obviously revolution. So, yes, I, I agree with you mm -hmm. that they um, the people who were issuing in these ideas themselves believe that public education and a form of neocameralism, i.e. proper enlightened government reforms, was needed in order to bring these ideas forward to again uh, create a you can say this uh petty bourgeois bourgeois nationalism if nothing else mm, mm. <laughs> no definitely yeah i mean hence the sort of the glut of uh public schools and and you know all other matters if i could just come in quickly um relating to the ottomans i mean going back to abdul hamid he did actually support a, a quite a big expansion of a european education in the empire so i mean it may have had more influence later on but mm. But but it's more of a question of you know you, you you can you can build schools but you still to some extent need again that sort of I mean economic base I mean unless you're going to give all of this schooling for free um, mm -hmm. you yeah. know I mean you, yeah you need that sort of gentry to exist um, I mean I'm curious mm -hmm. uh, this this might be a bit sort of tangential but um you know what was the sort of general um, state of the empire with regards to you know industrialization where were the sort of um the uh, sort of, where, 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 where were the main hot spots you know that that's an interesting question obviously constantinople and prusa um modern day bursa being another fundamental center but a, a fundamental aspect of the capitulations and by extension the free trade uh, situation in the ottoman empire meant that we don't have a situation like what happened in germany prussia German Prussian industrialization was in part made possible, not only because of Germany's abundance of resources and uh, the technical ability of those involved, but also because of the protectionist policies employed by Bismarck. The Ottoman Empire could not use protectionist policies as its entire economic sort of uh, administration was determined by foreign powers who relied on penetration of the Ottoman market and therefore free trade. And therefore they're heavily reliant on imports. Yes, right? they're heavily reliant on industrial imports and textiles from Great Britain. As a result of this, we see- And the Germans, you know, right? Yes, we see images of Abdul Hamid II trying to actually present images of Ottoman factories uh, to the Western world to present the Ottomans as a modern industrialized nation. But comparatively, the Ottomans were feeble 
as as an mm. industrial power compared the, to the this, that was actually part of the um the yeah the Tanzimat reforms. There was a an attempt to sort of break down the older guild systems and replace them yeah. with a sort of modern um yeah factory sort of system. I don't think and it went obviously very well. telegraph poles and railways as we've been discussing and so, Morse um, code as well. I think mm -hmm. Morse managed to get a patent from um, Abdul Hamid for um, for Morse code as well. Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll continue with this so we can actually get through <laughs> it. Um, this increasingly brought to the fore what could be called the public image of the state, which then formed the basis for the state's claimed legitimation. The political and intellectual atmosphere had a profound effect on the on the ruling elite of the Ottoman Empire, which, from the Sultan down, began to look for a new basis for defining what was increasingly coming to be considered an Ottoman citizenry. Very disparate elements in Ottoman society, ranging from the bureaucratic elite and the young Ottoman intelligentsia to the humble public, uh, popular ulama, felt that a new social base was needed if the empire was to survive. From this new social base, they hoped to confront the ideological challenges of the era. As Sedef Mardin put in what was still the seminal work on the subject, there occurred an ingathering of hitherto centrifugal forces. The common focus was on the desire to free the Ottoman Empire of its inferior position in relation with, to Western powers. The Ottoman elite rose to these challenges largely by reaffirming what they claimed to be the basis of legitimacy of the Islamic and secular institutions of the state. Despite their policies, which appeal theoretically to tradition, this was done in a fashion which was in fact quite novel and in many ways invented tradition in Hobsbawm's sense, that it would be desirable to see a study of attempts by some authentically legitimate dynasties, such as the Habsburgs, the Romanovs, not merely to command the obedience of their subjects, but to rally their loyalty as potential citizens. This study will, okay, well, I'll just skip over this just for a second. The developments in the Ottoman Empire clearly parallel similar trends to other imperial systems. Anderson accurately points to the phenomenon of russification and official nationalism, the policies of standardization, uh, standardization and uniformity pursued through education and attempted imposition of the imperial language on subject peoples. This concept well, yeah, of I mean, the Russians are, of course, trying to do the same thing with their conquest in sort of Central Asia, right? I mean, they're trying to bring all these different peoples into the fold as well. Well, not just Central Asia, but they're trying to renegotiate um, the essential covenant between the Polish population, the Baltic states, and of course Ukraine through various systems of edicts and ukases, which extend the system of russification. And of course, the Orthodox missionaries being sent to Central Asia, um, the genocide of the Circassians, and the creation of loyal Cossack hosts in uh, former rebellious sections of the Caucasus, etc. So, yes, mm. right. Um, this concept of national monarchy was precisely what the Ottoman elite were aiming for with its policy of Ottomanism, a concept meant to unite all peoples living in Ottoman domains, Muslim and non-Muslim, Turkish and Greek, Armenian and Jewish, Kurd and Arab. As such, it was a fine example of Anderson's definition of official nationalism because it was an anticipate, anticipatory strategy adopted by dominant groups who are threatened with marginalization or exclusion from an emerging nation, nationally imagined community. So I suppose in, um, in modern parlance, we could call it containment, right? You're sort of trying to get ahead. Yes, you you could you could see it as you could see it as containment. Or you could see it as forward planning. Um, um, I, 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 th I think, to my mind, containment has been very contaminated. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so, so I'm not sure necessarily. I would I would use that term, but um, it, it's definitely done in response to the Greek um, War of Independence and this idea of secret societies utilizing nationalism. So this this is, in a sense, yes, a form of containment in the sense you're trying to get ahead of these secret societies and create an iteration of nationalism, which would actually enforce loyalty as opposed to create division. So yes, in a sense, you're absolutely correct, Columba. This policy began with the, as you mentioned, Columba, the Edict of the Rose Chamber which declares the equality before the law of all Ottomans, Muslims and non-Muslims. The Ottomanism of Abdul Hamid II took on a much more Islamic character, although it did not reverse many of the administrative trends of the Tanzimat reforms. The concept of national monarchy was very much behind Abdul Hamid II's nationalist Islamism, although it is unclear how much of his decision making. Yeah, I think um, I, th I think Abdul Hamid wanted to have his baklava and eat it, didn't he? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I've always, I've, I've said, I think, previously on this channel that Turkism and Turkish nationality still isn't a thing in high, in high Ottoman circles, even at this late juncture. Remember, we're thinking only 20 years before the creation of uh, the Turkish Republic. His brand of Ottomanism was defined as an integrationist policy based on Islam, but an Islam which was becoming less and less ecumenical, i.e. in concert with other religions. What was happening, however, was very much what Anderson refers to as a stretching the short, tight skin of, nation, of the nation over the gigantic body of the empire. This was to be taken to its ultimate extent by the young Turks, but his ideological ancestry was to be found in the Hamidian era, i.e. Abdul Hamid II, although the two epochs are usually taken to be antipodal, i.e. opposed. In the Russian, Ottoman and Austrian cases, official nationalism meant that the person of the monarch came to be directly identified with state power, but this also had its risks, because now the monarch became directly responsible for the failures of the system. This is what happened to the House of Romanov, the Hohenzollerns, Habsburgs and the Ottomans, which literally came tumbling down to human scale. The Ottoman Caliphate was abolished, something as banal as an act of parliament in 1924, largely because what was left of its mystique had been carried away by defeating Great War. Uh, I disagree with that. I very much believe that was part of the own uh, vision and zeal of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, but I do agree yeah. in part that... So, so the mystique. general idea is sort of, um, uh, you know, the transition, what, what he's referring to there is the sort of transition from what you've called the, you know, the system of the port, right, or the court rule to this um, much more personal um, yes. autocratic direct rule yeah it's fascinating in a way that so much of the ottoman history i mean really really what we're talking about is since the late 16th century has been port rule has been the idea of the imperial the vizier and what have you and yeah. the, the intimacy of the court system and the presentation of the edict and there's no I, all the port in French, of course, through French correspondence. And there's no idea of who is actually responsible for the edict. The edict is normally in the name of the Sultan, but it's due to a collection of interests surrounding the Sultan in the harem and the imperial court. Nevertheless, when we get to Abdul Hamid II, we are seeing the assumption of the last, he, he is really meaning, in, the, in any meaningful sense, Abdul Hamid II is the last Sultan and the last Caliph, because the future um, uh, Sultans and Caliphs are just useless puppets and can be removed with little fanfare. Um, but Abdul Hamid actually wielded major power and had grand design, so to speak. And had very strong support as well, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. As 19th century imperialism reached its peak, the Ottoman state, the only non-Christian great power in Europe, great power with a big asterisk next to it, began to feel constant pressure to stake its claim in the world arena. The Ottomans were aware to the point of self-consciousness that they were the only major economic empire of pre-modern Islamic world to survive with institutional continuity and a degree of sovereignty into the era of modernization, emphasis on degree. Yet their very uniqueness meant that their sovereignty had to be constantly reconfirmed as being based in tradition. Although the empire had always stressed tradition, the 19th century context demanded its modernization or even its invention. The contributors to the volume of the invention of tradition draw attention in several instances to the great increase of neo-traditions in the 19th century. They point to the increased effort um, expended by the great powers to appear more imperial, more majestic through elaborate ceremonial and additional pomp and circumstance of the state, although ceremony had never been lacking in the Ottoman context from the time of Mahmoud II through to the Tanzimat reforms and afterwards. And we're seeing, um, I mean, we're seeing the same kind of sort of um, interesting reinvention in Europe proper as well, right? I mean, especially in Austria. Yes, one of the most notable symbols of the renewed emphasis on royal power and ceremonial in the late 19th century was heraldry. The sublime state, the Devlet i Ali, was symbolized by the coat of arms of the House of Osman, the Arma i Osmani. I just get it up here. The design had been commissioned from an Italian artist by Mahmoud II. Um, this is a very different from the actual one commissioned by Mahmoud II. I mean, I, I despise both of them. Nevertheless, they're interesting to talk about. <laughs> yes, they're quite, um, again, subtlety, not a strong suit. I, I think um, they got in an Italian artist, right? Yeah, just just just, um, just mentioned. It was um, such a well-established part of the Ottoman official tradition that when the Sultan asked for a detailed description of his contents in 1905, the bureaucracy was momentarily embarrassed because no official authorised version seemed to be readily available. 
Finally, it was dug up and the contents described. It, in a detailed memorandum, the Sultan was informed that the Ottoman coat of arms consisted of both old and new Turkish and Islamic motifs, such as arrangements and other symbolic objects. Isn't it interesting that in terms of invented tradition, um, that no one actually has any idea or is actually aware of the symbolism, which is supposed to be, again, that's the whole point of tradition. It's almost second nature that these people are supposed to know about these things. And so you need to look up and find the official description of which the Italian artist who originally commissioned this thing gave <laughs> <Yeah>. to you. <clears throat> the central motif in the shield was the exalted crown of the sultans, topped by the seal or tugra of the regnant ruler. This was flanked, and again, the equivalent in Europe would be a monogram, though I do believe the Arabic calligraphy of the Ottoman Tugras and the Diwani or the court style is really something to behold. Mm. This was flanked and, and, by... And the Tugra, that's a very sort of old um, um, Turkic word, isn't it? Uh, I, I can't, I, I'm going to, you know, Semigog is probably going to kill me in terms of its etymology. I'm going to have to look that up and put that on pause for a moment. But you see Tugras not just in... The Ottoman context. I mean, Diwan, you know, in terms of actually putting my language knowledge to the test, Diwan is Persian and Diwani therefore is courtly of the court. Mm. And Diwani script is where these Tugras come from. And you see Tugras in the Safavids and in the Mughals, the three great gunpowder empires, albeit they're of a different style. Um, the yeah, Ottoman a Tugra, ones, a Tugra is sort of um, like, like a sort of a character, which is a royal name. It's sort of almost like an Egyptian cartouche, right? Yes, and what you see with well, a cartouche is interesting. Nevertheless, the the sort of Muslim scholars would sort of try and de-emphasize that because, of course, following in from Hebrew tradition, the idea is on the emphasis of Arab calligraphy rather than painted forms or images of the face as an extension of the war and images and the iconoclasm of the Muslims. So instead, we see this, you know, with names of Muhammad, names of Ali, etc. We see these incredible sort of a calligraphic um, demonstrations of the name, which is supposed to invoke the awe and majesty, which is lacking in a portrait. Nevertheless, the Ottomans aren't so orthodox in their Isla in their um, yeah, <laughs> Islamic I mean, sort of scruples. I mean, they, they were uh, always we see, that way. We see, we see even way. yes, we see even um, Mehmed the Second commissioning Italian Renaissance portraits of himself. So <laughs> the Ottomans were never as strict to say, for example, as the Wahhabists are now. And of course, this is a time where Wahhabism and the House of Saud is actually indirect military, not only ideological opposition to the House of Osman. There are but, some um, there, uh, you know, Turkish miniature paintings. There are some, there are some fantastic depictions of Muhammad. Um, you know, yeah. um, the, <laughs> there, there are cases around. Where, you know, he's just sort of, he's, he's fire. His, his arms and his face are just sort of pillars of fire um, in, in, a, in a sort of fine dress. It's, it's really bizarre. Um, but yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're great to look at. Mm -hmm. This was flanked by two heavy tomes, one symbolizing Islamic law, Seriad, and the other modern law codes. Onto these appeared a set of scales representing justice. The central motif was surrounded and flanked by symbolic ornaments, the old balancing the new, an arrow and quiver and an infantry rifle and bayonet, an old muzzle-loading cannon and a modern field artillery piece, a traditional scimitar and a modern, modern cavalry sabre and so forth. The coat of arms also included traditional Islamic Ottoman symbols, such as a vase full of blossoming roses and incense, which represented the magnanimity of the state. And of course, the rose being synonymous with magnanimity. I mean, I would go back all the way to uh, the first room we did on the Ottomans and the images of Mehmet II holding the rose and this going back to his predecessors at the same time. The total design was so again very much a reimagining, yet cast in this strangely sort of uh, Europeanized iteration. I mean, I don't even know sort of what word to really describe this in terms of a sort of facsimile of European heraldry, combining all of these ad hoc elements of Ottoman symbolism and this. Well, I, I would go to say something rather grotesque, and I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, it's all a bit of a hodgepodge, isn't it? Mm. Yes, a hodgepodge is a nicer way of putting it. I was thinking of something uh, uh, less benign than that, but anyway. Um, the total design was flanked on the right side by a cluster, of red, a cluster of red banners, and on the left by a cluster of green banners, symbolizing the Sultanate and the Islamic nature of the Caliphate, of course, green being the color of Islam. 
set under the entire design with a whole array of Ottoman declaration, I mean, declarations. Even, even, even today, right? I mean, the flag of the Saudis is green and so forth. Yeah. And the Turkish flag is red as well. Yeah. So. Set under the entire design with a whole array of Ottoman decorations. The central themes of the Ottoman coat of arms revolved around the continuity of old and new, traditional and modern, yet it was an inventive tradition stemming from the need of the Ottomans uh, feeling to emphasize that they were a great power like all others. The fact that the imperial coat of arms bristled with weaponry is, of course, indicative of the actual weakness of the state relative to its peers. The symbol of the Ottoman Empire can therefore be seen to represent the use of ancient materials to construct inventive traditions of a novel type for quite novel purposes. It was also a very succinct expression to the Ottoman state's myth symbol complex. Yes, we're trying to create all of these images and thrust them together into one image, regardless of how that ultimately ends up. Just as the Ottomans tried to emphasize pre-existing traditions by including them in the symbol of state, they also attempted to curtail the circulation of what were considered rival symbols. Correspondence between the Chancellor of the Grand Vizier and the palace dealt with the issue of the importation of goods, whose packaging bore the coat of arms of rival powers. The Sultan wanted to forbid the entry of such packages, but the Grand Vizier had to point out that there was no legal way for the Ottoman customs to keep them out. <laughs> oh, when I read that, I found I found that slightly absurd. I mean, what you you know, you, you can't have any depictions of a foreign coat of arms, even on an import. I mean, how much how much of a threat could that really be? I mean, it, it sort of bespeaks a real a real. No, I think it's, I, I, mean, I, I think it's interesting because you can have other forms of you know ensigns or signs, can't you? You can have something marking a national sort of or a national sort of origin point, but I think, if anything, removing the idea of having strictly heraldic symbols which are competing with your own is a weird. You can say almost pathetic sense of trying yeah. to assert <laughs> national sovereignty. There is only one sultan in the Ottoman Empire, um, and you know I will not have the images of any other presented here. It's quite interesting, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, rather especially. Pathetic. Yes, considering um, in reality the, the sort of the weakening of the empire compared to others, you know, this is the only way they can sort of assert themselves. We will not have foreign heraldry paraded through the palace. Yeah, just give me this. Give me this one win. <laughs> <laughs> The visual confirmation of sovereignty was also extended to non-Muslim places of worship. The Grand Vizier Kamal Pasha in 1885 reported that the Armenian Catholic Church in Boyokderi, a village on the Bosphorus on the outskirts of Istanbul, had erected a commemorative plaque stating that the church had been constructed during the just and glorious reign of Abdul Hamid II. The initiative seems to have come from the Armenian Archbishop, who declared that this was being done for the first time in a Christian temple. In fact, the Sultan was rather unsure about how appropriate this whole business was and ordered it to be secretly investigated as to what the exact wording on the plaque consisted of to promptly display and might be offensive to Muslim public opinion. Kamil Pasha reported back that there was a harmless display of loyalty and in any case, the plaque was displayed in, in a courtyard where few Muslim eyes would see it. Abdul Hamid II apparently soon overcame his shyness and the erection of official iconography on non-Muslim official buildings became commonplace. An order dated from 1894 declared that the request of the Catholic Archbishop of um, Uskup, uh, Skopje, which is now the, uh, the capital of Northern Macedonia, apologize to any Greek nationalists out there, um, to display a plaque bearing the imperial monogram, the Tugra, on the Archbishop's residence was to be granted. The decision was based on the precedent that various archbishoprics of other confessions have in the past thus been honored with this august symbol. It's very That's interesting, isn't it, that the um, um, Catholic um, um, clergy would sort of want to use that symbol as a sort of mark of prestige. Um, do you think they were sort of, um, um, what was the goal there? They were sort of trying to buy into the new sort of um, Ottoman state, or, or we're talking or... about, and we're talking about a Catholic archdiocese in the center of Macedonia, which is surrounded by Orthodox and Muslims. So yes, um, this is they can say trying to establish a direct vertical relationship and patronage with the Sultan. Imperial over, immediacy, good yes, old imperial, imperial immediacy. Imperial immediacy over your other religious rivals. So yes, I, I think there is not there is an argument to be made for that. Official coat of arms and decorations were ubiquitous in the 19th century. The Ottoman state was as preoccupied with them as the rest of the world. 
in 1892, the Villette, or again, this is a minor note, but the old province of Ielet had been replaced with the term Villayet. Yeah, I wish Semigog was here in order to um, describe the chronology, but as far as I'm concerned, it's it sort of indicates the transition of the provinces, the Ielet, to the departments, the Villayet, i.e. the French departments, i.e. trying to create a centralised French-esque, Frenchified system of administration, albeit not very successfully, of Konya, reported that certain Greek notables in the town of Esparta had been wearing their official decorations and uniforms to church during the Easter service. The governor proudly reported that he had to stop this inappropriate practice. He was, no doubt much surprised, promptly re reprimanded and told that these people are wearing their decorations as a gesture of pride and loyalty and should not be interfered with. Another clear example of invented tradition in an Ottoman context is the traditionally oriental headgear, the fez. And I just yes. want to <laughs> bring up bring up these magnificent demonstrations Time. of the fez here, <laughs> seen by Westerners as the ultimate symbol of Turkishness. Apparently Moroccan in origin, the fez was declared in 1832 to be the official head covering of all the subjects of the empire by Sultan Mahmud II, who was the predecessor to Sultan Abdul Mejid II. What, 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 what is the magnificent portrayal on the left? What is the thinking behind the fez? I mean, what, why the fez of all things? I've never understood. Well, it's I distinctive. Mean, but, but it, it, you know, it's Moroccan. I mean, is there not... You know, what about like a nice turban or something? I mean, I, I don't understand. That's so strange. Uh, I'll just finish this. Uh, I, I, I just finished the, the, the own explanation within the article. It was to be worn by Muslim and non-Muslims alike to abolish external distinctions between communities. Mahmud um, had abolished the Janissary Corps in 1826, and a new form of headgear was thus needed for a new army he was attempting to build up. Thus, the ubiquitous symbol of the Turk in the 19th century was only a, re a relatively recent creation, an important one of that. So you can say almost that the Fez is almost like a national rendition of the Pickelhalber in Germany. <laughs> yeah. Or, um, to continue our sort of Chinese analogy, it could be the equivalent of the, uh, the Q. Oh, yes, that's what I was thinking. Well, yeah. Yeah. Of the Ming Din of the yeah, the Qing Dynasty Q. Um, albeit there were I mean there, uh, there wasn't such a severe prescription that yeah. in order to cut off your Q you would be killed on the spot. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, you don't have that um, that that Chinese charm. <laughs> well, not Chinese Manchurian charm in this case, but uh, I mean the the implication is the same. What is it Chinese wacky knee? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear uh but the impl the implication is clear it's a it's a sign and it's almost like a profession of faith in the nation so it's a superficial demonstration of nationality you know it, the whole idea of the the queue and uh uh, the cut foot, the cut hair, and the forehead became so synonymous that people just took it to mean Chinese. When of course it was a direct demonstration of loyalty to the Manchurian dynasty in China. But yes, as the same, you can say the same logic applies. And of course, there is a military application, and that is a form of submission. A sphere of invented tradition in the Ottoman Empire, which paralleled European developments, is that of official music, represented by the national anthem, being very much part of the iconography of neo traditions. The Ottoman Empire took its first steps in that direction when Mahmud II and his successor, Abdul Jamid I, employed Giuseppe Donizetti as the court musician from 1828 until he died in 1856, um, composer of such operas such as uh, the Daughter of the Regiment, etc. Donizetti composed the um, Mahmoudi, the march, which established a pattern. Donizetti then composed the Medici di March and trained a band of palace musicians selected from among the children of leading notables, a venture enthusiastically supported by the Sultan. No less a personage than Franz Liszt then composed a paraphrase to Donizetti's Mahmoudi March in 1847. Of course, Franz Liszt was European world-renowned pianist. Um, he was followed by Johann Strauss, who dedicated a composition to Abdul Jamid in 1849. I'm guessing that's Johann Strauss Sr., who had just written the uh, Rudetsky uh, the Rudetsky March um, and was rewarded with gift of a ring. After Donizetti's death, uh, Callisto Gautelli became court musician in 1856 and composed the Aizi March for Sultan Abdul Aziz. Guatelli served well into the reign of Abdul Hamid and was known for his Oriental Overture and Ottoman, La Ottoman March. It is likely, though unclear, that he was also responsible for the Hamidi March. 
of course, after Abdul Hamid II. So, both um, done as... um, with regards to the sort of the musical contributions, um, especially, I mean, from the Germans, would you say that was sort of part of the, um, you know, the close relationship that they had? I mean, because of course, in, in the case of many of these musicians, I'm sure, you know, it's just the fact that you want a very wealthy, um, um, you know, notable patron, right? I mean, I can understand that, but is there sort of a, um, a deeper, um, something deeper at work here as well? Well, um, despite his name, Franz Liszt, if you're referring to, was actually Hungarian. But I suppose that's beside the point. Well, but, I was talking about I was talking about Strauss, but yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I, I, well, Strauss was Austrian, but probably Austrian Germans. Ah, oh, they're all they're all the same. <laughs> they're all the same. <laughs> Continentals, you know, <laughs> the French. What does it matter? <laughs> I'm going to be more cynical and just say that these were hard up musicians who were always desperate yeah. for patronage. Yeah. yeah. I, by the time of, I mean, have you read The Life of Wagner? <laughs> by the time of Abdul Hamid II, the second generation of official musicians have been trained. Uh, Gazimiha points out the Sultan felt a need for a much tighter discipline in order to be able to compete with Europe. By the time of Abdul Hamid the, um, Abdul Hamid's reign, it became quite commonplace to compose marches as a means of seeking favor. In 1893, and this isn't anything unique to Germany and unique to um, the Ottomans, this was endemic throughout everywhere in the European 19th century. In 1893, a Mademoiselle Lorette Rosette composed a Chant Turk, Vive le Sultan. Uh, this was followed by a uh, Dikron uh, Thohad Dijan's Grand March, which was dedicated to the Sultan in 1895. As in music, a feature of 19th century commemorative iconography was the commemorative medallion. Perhaps the most interesting among the Ottoman examples of this genre as a bid for modernity, combined with time-honored historical legitimation, is a medallion struck in 1850 during the reign of Abdul Majid, um, an admirable document of the late Ottoman state of mind. It is emblazed with the slogan, Set itat subister Pa, um, pa, sorry, for some reason, my Latin pronunciation is really leaving me. Pace qui dia le vote. On one no, side. That, that's because that's French. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Sorry, I'm, I'm just losing my mind here. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> On one side, it features a fortress and a smoky cloud over which flies the Ottoman banner. Um, on the rim, I found such slogans as uh, Justice Gal Potor. Uh, protection de Febi, uh, equal, that... equal justice for all, protection of the feeble, yeah. the estate, the, the state relieves. Um... Yes. On the reverse, the motifs include the Central Asian Turkish cap and engraved in various places Mehmed II, the conqueror of Istanbul, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, Ali, uh, together with Racid, a major figure in the reform movement, and Kaprulu, Mehmet Kaprulu, the architect of the revived Ottoman power in the second half of the 16th century. We should Another... say, that, by the way, just, just quickly, that um, that slogan, uh, Cet état subsistera uh, parce que Dieu le veut, that, that basically means um, the state um, subsists, so the state remains because it is the will of God. And so there is still that sort of um, very fundamental strain as well. It reminds me a little bit of the um, sort of our monarchy's expression. Was it Jue Mondra? God yeah, in God right. in my right. Yeah, yeah. classic. Mm. Another case of modern usage of ancient forms was the inclusion of the Ottoman genealogical lineage in the state almanacs, the Sarname. The Almanac for 1885 traces the roots of the Ottoman family back to Adam and Eve via Noah. The official, this is an interesting tie and strangely to our, our to the Armenian um, uh, conversation earlier. The official dynastic myth of how uh, Seljuk Sultan Aladin uh, Kekobad protected Osman, the founder of the dynasty, is duly recounted. It claims that the House of Osman is, according to the research of experts, one of the oldest in the world and will last forever. Uh, that's not necessarily a terrible claim, given the number of Ottoman claimers there are today. It is interesting that such manifest official fiction, an ancient tradition in Islamic court literature, would be featured in a state almanac created by bureaucratic modernization and featuring such mundane data as the names of various ministers. The same adaptation of old motifs for new usages was observable in the very document that symbolized the Tanzimat, the imperial rescript, of the Rose Chamber. Even while setting out the reasons for the new laws, the declaration based itself quite deliberately on religious dogma, stating that it is evident that countries not governed by the laws of the Syriac cannot prevail. 
Yet what it decreed was very much against the Syria, that is, the legal equality of Muslims and non-Muslims. In the same vein, the document declared that tax assessment and collection would be carried out according to rational methods on an equitable basis. This appeal to modernity, however, couched in the language of classic Islamic, Islamic image of the circle of equity, just laws made make, uh, for prosperous subjects, prosperous subjects pay their taxes, taxes pay for soldiers, soldiers protect the taxpayers, and so on. Thus, although it heralded nothing less than the beginnings of a modern secular state, the language used was that of Islam, with good reason. The measure of legal equality was clearly unpopular among Muslim subjects, who felt their assured place of superiority in the empire was lost. In some ways, what Abdul Hamid II felt was the very pulse of despondency among his Muslim subjects. The old Sultan had certainly a difficult problem to face in the early years of his reign. In 1880 to 1882, a hopeless despondency about the future of the country reigned everywhere in Turkish society. Abdul Hamid had to create a feeling of hope among the Muslim subjects. Abdul Hamid introduced a new religious idea. He revived the idea of the Caliphate, a scheme for strengthening the Mohammedan feeling and making Turkey the centre of a Mohammedan revival. In furthering this aim, the person of the Sultan was made to acquire a certain aura of sacrality. This stretched to the extent that the hair and fingernails of the august person were saved, washed in a silver container by specially appointed servants, and sent to the Hijaz every year as part of a ceremonial caravan, the Sur Ali, which bore the annual gifts to the holy places. <laughs> charming, charming. Yeah. Who doesn't want some fingernails, right? Mm. Yet, as in cases above, this accompanied the effort to be like other modern rulers. It's interesting, however, just this idea of couching secular reforming language within older language used to reference, again, the circle of equity, the idea of Islamic harmony. It really does seem directly subversive, doesn't it? The idea that you're couching well, yeah, because that term would have applied only yes, to Muslims, right? Yes, Definitely. radical revolutionary reforms in the terms of tradition. Friday prayer had also been an important ceremony or occasion in Islamic and Ottoman practice, for it was when the ruler participated in public worship and showed himself to the people. In the 19th century, Friday prayer acquired ceremonial trappings inspired from European examples. Despite his mortal fear of assassination, well-founded as it turned out because of an attempt in 1905, Abdul Hamid made the effort to show himself to the populace once a week. The royal procession would leave the Adiz palace with great pomp. The imperial landau, flanked by mounted Albanian house guards and livery, and made its way to the Yildiz mosque, admittedly not very far away. After the service, special officials were circulated among the throne and collected petitions, which would then be forwarded to a branch of the bureaucracy, which dealt specifically with petitions received on those occasions. A physical manifestation of this change towards a modern public persona of a monarch was seen in the mosque architecture in the 19th century. The classic Ottoman mosque was altered to suit the ceremonial protocol of European usage, so an additional two-story structure was added to maintain the building as a ceremonial public space, giving more wildly character to the buildings. After the Russo-Ottoman War of 77-78, and the consequent loss of most of the Balkan Christian provinces, the official nationalism of the port became more Islamic in favour and style. Abdul Hamid, a convinced autocrat and a ruler who had no time for experimentation with democracy, recast the myth-symbol complex of his state in a different mould. Where the Tanzimat had stressed the equality of all subjects, Abdul Hamid realigned the basis of the state on a more Islamic foundation. However, here one has to be careful. The Islamism of Abdul Hamid was in many ways a new creation. Although the motifs and style of state ideology were Islamic, much of his policy stemmed from secular considerations aimed at the secular ends of retrenchment and last-ditch defence. Nor did the Sultan attempt to turn the clock back. He continued many of the dominant trends of the Tanzimat period, most noticeably the emphasis on centralisation and the spread of education. The underlying motive force behind all of these considerations was that the Ottoman Empire felt threatened both morally and physically. The sublime state saw that it was constantly lose, uh, losing manoeuvring space in an ever-shrinking world. Just as it was attempting to improve its public image both towards its own subjects and towards the outside world, the challenges mounted. Perhaps the most dangerous of these challenges was missionary activity. 
the Ottomans realized very early that there was an organic link between 19th century imperialism and missionary zeal. Everywhere, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is the sort of classic idea that, you know, if you convert a population, then you're essentially creating someone who's going to be um, loyal to a foreign, a foreign power, right? Mm. Everywhere, the missionary appeared as representative of a superior civilization and culture, the primary vehicle for the realization of the white man's burden. Not only did the missionaries undermine the efforts of the Ottomans to legitimize the basis of their rule at home, but they also proved influential in creating adverse conditions for the Ottomans abroad by feeding the Western press with anti-Ottoman sentiment. Many missionaries and Western journalists proceeded upon the confident assumption that the terrible Turk belonged to a retrograde race of devil worshippers. I just think of an interesting comparison between 19th century missionaries and modern non-governmental organizations anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Blair, Blair would have loved this. <laughs> Deeply subversive. <laughs> Particularly in the reign of Abdul Hamid II, missionary activity picked up momentum during the 1880s and 1890s with British, French, Russian and American missionaries passing out spheres of activity within the empire. This led to a situation where, as Jeremy Saltz argues, the relationship that developed between the missionaries and the Ottoman government was one of mutual suspicion and dislike. Indeed, by the 1880s, the Sultan came to regard the missionaries as the most dangerous enemies to the social order among all the foreigners living in his domains. Diplomats, merchants, soldiers all had to do with the here and now. The missionaries, through their schools, had to do with the future. In this respect, the missionary issue, far too complicated to be dealt with exhaustively in this study, forms one of the key issues for understanding what was increasingly an Ottoman obsession with their public image. There is ample evidence in the Ottoman archival sources that the Ottoman ruling elite feared infiltration, not only of its Christian minorities, but also of its Muslim population, as well as other marginal groups, such as the New Yassis and the Ye Yezidi Kurds. Moreover, it was precisely these marginal elements which were coming to the fore of the state that felt it had to squeeze the last resources of untapped manpower. The Ottoman response was a desperate attempt at social engineering, which found its main expression in an effort to shore up the Sunni Hanafi Mazheb as the basis of official religiosity, the official belief. This policy furnished a good example of what Smith calls the process of turning a largely aristocratic and lateral ethnicity and former polity into a fully political nation through a conscious program of mass education and propaganda. Although the Hanafi school of jurisprudence had always enjoyed, enjoyed official endorsement in the Ottoman Empire, um, strict imposition of orthodoxy was not stressed in the more cosmopolitan atmosphere of earlier periods. There is an exception to this, where we talked about the brief Hanafi restoration after the Sultanate of Women during the middle reign and the Kapulu, dynasty, Kapulu period of the reign of Mehmed IV, mm. which preceded the fall of Vienna. So at that time, there was a feeling of Ottoman decline, Ottoman moral uh, denigration, and therefore there was a moment of, you can say, moral uh, of islamic orthodoxy which preceded a reorganization restructuring of the empire and temporary expansion before that grand defeat in 1683. Mm. this new so this isn't something new to the ottoman empire this new emphasis on orthodoxy one sphere in which the ottomans had recourse to invented traditions was a good example of adaptation taking places for old uses in new conditions and by using old models for new purposes in furthering the same, the sublime state embarked on a hitherto unprecedented program of what could only be called counter-propaganda. This effort involved the active encouragement of conversion to the Hanefi sect, and for the first time, the Ottomans envision, envisioned using missionary zeal to fight missionary zeal. Mm. The focus of most missionary activity was in eastern Anatolia and the Arab provinces, the Vilayet particularly Syria and the notoriously heterodox Iraqi vilayets of Basra, Mosul and Baghdad saw increased activity in the 1890s. The increase in British influence in Iran in the last quarter of the 19th century paralleled the increase of Protestant American British activity in the frontier zone between the Ottoman heartlands and Iran. One example among others, the Imperial Decree in 1892, stated that English priests had been in the vicinity of Kavar on the Ottoman-Iranian border. These priests, it was reported, were distributing books and pamphlets among the local Nestorian population, Persian uh, Christians. One had been apprehended and an investigation had been launched. The Sultan decreed that they be chased away in the firmest manner again, a 
little indication of utilization of sovereignty, but also, I think, a firm basis to discover that the Ottomans have abandoned this process of the millet, of the millet and you can say this process of partial religious toleration and they are seeking formal unity and reconsolidation around Islam not just by appealing to this identity in the already existent Muslims but by effectively consolidating the Muslims that exist in the empire within a new religious block under the Hanafi school and persecuting Christians and driving them or if not killing them and as in the case of the, Hamid, of the Hamidian massacres. So I think that's really enough in terms of setting up the decline of the Ottoman Empire yeah, and the I think attempted, we're set up pretty perfectly for next time, and, yes and the attempted resolution and when we come back to this topic we'll be talking about uh, the decline from the Ottoman Empire because this is really a talk about orthodoxy and nationality uh the, the next stage in this conversation will be taking place from the Greek and the Balkan perspective and the Romanian perspective and of course the Armenian perspective when uh, I revisit that topic uh, with uh, Gudea at um, some later time. So I'll, I'll quickly go over the super chats but um, Columba is there oh, and Hitman is there anything else you want to say in um, summary as we uh, as we finish off today's uh, stream? Um, I don't have anything to say what about you Hitman? Um, well, something um, I'd like to bring up is I'm um, going back to the sort of economic situation, especially with the Ottomans sort of being forced to have free trade. Um, I've recently been reading the uh, National System of Political Economy by uh, Friedrich List, and um, though mm -hmm. he doesn't really talk about the um, the Turks, from reading it, um, I feel like I've got a read of what he would be sort of be looking at with the Ottomans. I think he would say, well, the reason they stagnated was because they did not have yes they had their sort of state but they were just having unravel free trade they undermined their own economic position because they couldn't preserve or build any sort of power from their agricultural manufacturing sector they, they just got exploited essentially mm. yeah i mean that's one of the flaws of a, an imperial system i suppose i mean it tends to happen doesn't it Mm. Well, well, thank you. Thank you both of you. We haven't got many super chats today, so I'll just quickly get through them. Um, Speedrunner for $10, thank you very much, just says, have a donation. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Speedrunner. I'll, I'll translate that to have a donation, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was struggling there with your uh, yeah. barbarous <laughs> chatties. Yes. Yeah. Uh, John Gordon for $5. Um, how did Turkish educational institutions perform during this period? I think we've covered that pretty extensively. Um, I don't think we can really cover it anymore because, I'm, again, I'm not an expert in this field. I can't really elaborate more. But obviously, um, it was successful up until a point and in part served to undermine. Um, well, again, you're talking about Turkish rather than Ottomans. So maybe, if anything, it did perform, perform rather well because it helped facilitate the rise in Turkish nationalism. But um, as for the Ottoman, like it was a two, it was a two-edged sword. Obviously, the Ottomans needed a new system of education to inculcate this new sense of um, Islamic identity. Yet at the same time, receiving these ideas, particularly from abroad and um, uh, exiled uh, organisations, the Union of Progress, etc., obviously gave credence to the um, Young Turk Revolution in 1908 and the scattered sort of ideological period between 1908 and 1913 before we have the pan-Turkism of Enver Pasha. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, Columba, uh, is there anything you would like to say before we go? Um, yes, actually. Um, on Wednesday, I am going to be doing a quick panel discussion with um, all the guys who were on the poetry panel. At the event um so you'll have um alexander adams uh panama hat uh rupert august i think and then uh S sb wicket as well who i don't think he, he couldn't make it to the event but um yeah we're going to be talking about um some of our poems that um, we published together in this little collection and then also um you know the the situation of modern poetry um the political purpose or or the political utility of poetry or the relationship of poetry to 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 politics um and historical developments so yeah i think it'll be uh, an interesting little discussion so if anyone's um uh you know has a free evening on wednesday then by all means tune in hitman um all i have to say is um i have a twitter account you can follow me there and um, my followers is growing steadily good good yes you all need to go and follow hitman you must 
Thank Absolutely. you for endorsement, Columba. Yes, and I, I concur, endorse, and uh, echo those statements for wholeheartedly. So go and uh, sub to Hitman. Um, so thank you, everyone. Just uh, channel news. Um, obviously, if you like this video, do like, uh, comment, and possibly subscribe if you're not already smash, subscribed. Smash, smash that like uh, button. Also, um, uh, consider joining the channel. Um, all members can access a stream that Columba and I did yesterday. Uh, mm. We did a alt history scenario where we discuss what if England had remained Catholic throughout the 16th and 17th centuries and what the implications of that would have been for not only English history, but European and world history. So uh, become a member, uh, get access to members only streams and around 40 streams of heterodox episodes, the first um, Politeia podcast series, uh, a lot of talking content as well. So absolutely join the channel, uh, become an Equestrian Tier member if you want to access the vast majority of that content. But anyone, uh, any channel member can view Sunday's stream on alternative history. So thank you very much again to everyone for listening. Thank you to my wonderful guests for making this all possible. And I will see you for my lecture on Friday. I will be lecturing again on Friday where I talk about Russian history, unshakable autocracy. So thank you very much and very goodbye. Good. Thanks guys. Thanks guys.